Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along in what looks to be one of the nicest mornings of the year so far. And hasn't it been a long winter? We've all been waiting for mornings like this. Let's hope it stays to be an afternoon like this, which would be uh, one of the few we've had since November of last year, I think. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jackie Maguire. I head up Brodie's um, Government Regulation and Competition Team. I'm very pleased to see you all here this morning. We're not going to be speaking for 15 minutes uh, to introduce uh, the seminar. And we're going to go on with business quite quickly. We have got quite a full agenda to get through. The first of the sessions this morning is going to look at new duties for local government. But it occurs to me as I look at the whole of the programme that all of this morning is going to be looking at either new duties or new challenges or more challenges and ongoing challenges for local government. And it's, it's very clear to me that you're facing a significant number of challenges, both new and ongoing at this particular point in time, and that those challenges affect every area of service delivery for which local government is responsible. And those areas of service delivery themselves are continually being extended through legislation. So I think really without any further ado, we'll crack on with our first um, session this morning, which is going to look at uh, new duties for local government. The session is going to be delivered by Kenzie Sharkey and myself. Kenzie is one of the newest members of our team, having joined us earlier this year from North Ayrshire Council. Apologies to colleagues from <laughs> North Ayrshire Council for plundering such a wonderful resource. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to check with you before I start. Am I just clicking through this? Yep, okay. Um, so, good morning. As Jackie said, my name's Kenzie, and I've recently joined the team from North Ayrshire Council. Now, I can recognise at least um, one familiar face in the audience here today from North Ayrshire, but I'm hoping, because I've asked her very nicely, Carolyn, that she'll keep her heckling to a minimum throughout today's presentation. Um, that being said, however, I do know that we're keen to encourage discussion as part of this morning's sessions. Um, so I am able to assure you that there will be an opportunity to ask questions of both myself and Jackie at the end of the presentation. I would also ask you to save all of your difficult questions until Jackie's presentation is fresh in your minds. Oh, maybe not that straightforward. Sorry. Great, thank you. Sorry. So, um, the intention behind this morning's session is to provide you with an overview of the four new duties for lo local government which are shown on the slide. These have either recently come into effect or they're proposed in forthcoming legislation. The first two duties shown on the slide, the duty of candour and the socio-economic duty, will be covered by myself. I'll then hand you over to Jackie, who will cover the remaining two duties, the new duties in respect of island communities, which are proposed as part of the Island Scotland's Bill, and the reporting duty under the Children and Young People Scotland Act. The four new duties cover a wide range of local government services and they were required to be applied at both strategic and operational levels. Despite their broad scope, however, I think there are a number of common themes which will emerge throughout the course of this morning's presentation. In particular, it seems to me that all the duties have been introduced with public sector reform in mind. There's a clear focus on increasing transparency in decision-making processes, as well as a shift towards a more person or in some cases a wider, more community-centred approach to decision-making and improved service delivery by local authorities. I think it will be important to recognise and remember these themes when we look at how to demonstrate compliance with the duties. So, to begin, the duty of candour. What is it? The duty of candour is a statutory duty imposed on providers of health and social care to inform patients when they've been harmed as a result of the care or treatment that they've received. For the purposes of the legislation, an organisation to which the duty applies is called a responsible person, and it will include all local authorities where they provide or where they arrange for the provision of health, 
care and social work services. The duty was introduced on the 1st of April this year and it's contained at part two of the Health, Tobacco, <coughs> Nicotine Care Scotland Act 2016. It's perhaps worth noting that a number of um, health and social care professionals are already subject to a duty of candour procedure as part of their professional practice requirements. I point out, however, that the new duty is distinct from this as it applies to an organisation rather to the, than the individual who is delivering the care or treatment. The duty applies where harm has been caused as a result of the service provided by the local authority. The outcomes which are considered to amount to harm are listed at section 21 of the Act and they cover a relatively broad spectrum. They include, perhaps unsurprisingly, death, eh, but also harm which, although not severe, results in an increase in the person's treatment. The Act also requires that the harm which has been caused is a direct result of the incident, so it can't be a result of an individual's illness or an underlying condition which they suffer from. Where it's been established that harm has been caused, a local authority will be required to follow the duty of candour procedure, which is set out in the regulations which accompany the Act. The duty of candour procedure essentially requires a local authority to conduct a full review of the circumstances which led to the harm and to identify the actions it will take in response to it. The local authority is required to involve the relevant person throughout the review process and to take account of their views. A relevant person will normally be the person who's been harmed as a result of the incident, but in some circumstances it may be a family member or a carer. The purpose of the review process is also set out in the regulations and is shown on the slides. The actions identified by the authority must be for the purposes of either improving the quality of the service or sharing learning with other organisations. There are therefore clear signposts within the regulations to the background of public service reform which I touched on earlier. In particular, the need to involve service users as part of that improvement process. Um, sorry, excuse me. So the further mechanics of the duty of candour procedure are set out in detail in the regulations. Thankfully, these make for relatively easy, although perhaps not entertaining reading. From a compliance perspective, local authorities should be aware, however, that certain timescales apply to the procedure. The first timescale is that the relevant person must be notified of the incident within one month of it occurring. And the second timescale which applies is that the review must be completed by the local authority within three months of the date on which the harm was caused. In both cases, if the timescale is not met, the local authority must provide the, re the relevant person with written reasons for the delay. The regulations also prescribe a number of mandatory matters which must be covered as part of the review of the incident. When conducting a review, a local authority must invite the relevant person to attend the meeting. The form and the particular matters that must be covered at that meeting are set out at Regulation 6. But the key point to note is that it should be structured around the individual and it must provide them with an opportunity to ask questions of the authority and to express their views on the incident. Following this meeting, a written report of the review together with the actions identified by the authority, must also be provided to the relevant individual. A written apology is also required to be provided, and although the regulations do not provide the manner or time scale for an apology, I think it would seem sensible to include this as part of the review report. Sorry, I'm just noticing that my slides don't appear to actually match with the ones I have in front of me, so sorry if this seems a little disjointed. Um, Finally, the duty of candour procedure imposes certain reporting and monitoring requirements on local authorities. Local authorities will be required to keep a written record of all cases in which the duty has been followed and to publish an annual report. The first annual reports will be required to be published at the end of this financial year and must identify the number of occasions on which the duty has been applied. The report will also be required to provide an, access, uh, sorry, an assessment of the extent to which the local authority has complied with the duty. 
This may require a little more in the way of thought in advance of the deadline for publication, and I think it will be important for local authorities to begin to consider now how they can record information in a way that will allow them to evidence compliance. Finally, I would like to conclude on the duty of candour with a further observation on compliance. In addition to being able to show how it has complied with the statutory timescales and the procedure set out in the regulations, my feeling is that it will be particularly important for local authorities to demonstrate how they have involved service users in the review process and taken their reviews into account in improvements which are made. In other words, I think compliance with the duty will require local authorities to show that it's been a real shift towards supporting improvements on services through the transparent and person-centred approach to public service reform. Turning now to the socio-economic duty, and hopefully this matches up with what I have in front of me, it places a further set of new obligations on local authorities. The duties contained at Section 2 of the Equality Act, but was only brought into force in Scotland with effect from the 1st of April this year. The power to commence the duty was included in the Scotland Act following the recommendations of the Smith Commission, and in October 2016, the Scottish Government adopted the commencement of the duty as the first action in their Fairer Scotland plan. The socio-economic duty should therefore also be understood against the wider background of public service reform. This has been identified by the Scottish Government as placing communities and people at the heart of service delivery and policy making. I think it is also reflected in the interim guidance which has been published to accompany the Act, which encourages innovation in how public authorities meet the new duty and develop best practices which reflect the needs of their communities. So, in a nutshell, what is it? Essentially, the duty requires that certain public bodies have regard when making decisions to socio-economic inequalities and how these can be reduced. The duty only applies, however, to strategic making by certain public bodies. Those public bodies are specified in the regulations to, uh, to the duty and include all local authorities. The term strategic decisions, however, is not defined in legislation. But the interim guidance pro provides, a formal, sorry, it provides the informal definition which is shown on the slide. The guidance also lists a number of examples of strategic decisions which are particularly relevant to local authorities. And these include the preparation of local development plans or local outcome improvement plans, the preparation of any corporate plan, the preparation of new strategic frameworks or an annual budget, as well as any major procurement decisions taken by the authority. In addition to identifying what strategic decisions it takes, the duty will also require local authorities to think about how it defines the term socio-economic disadvantage. Again, no statutory definition is provided, but the guidance does offer the starting point definition, which is shown on the slide and can be used or adapted by local authorities as they see fit. While the absence of a statutory definition may seem unhelpful, I think it's important to understand it against the wider background of public service reform. The intention behind the flexible, the flexible approach which has been adopted is to allow authorities to choose and to develop definitions which reflect and respond to the communities that they serve. This flexible community-centred approach to the duty will also require an authority to identify the particular inequalities of outcome that it seeks to address. Now, if you're concerned, as I suspect that you might be, that this could place yet another demand on the already stretched resources of your authority, I might be able to offer you some comfort in the form of the advice contained in the guidance, which confirms that the key inequalities of outcome for local authorities will already be identified in local outcome improvement pl plans and locality action plans. The guidance also recognises that the outcomes need to be realistic and restricted to those which can actually be achieved by the local authority through the delivery of its services. Further comfort may also be drawn from the fact that the duty does not place a requirement on local authorities to achieve results. All that's required is that the local authority is able to demonstrate that it's a due regard to the need to reduce inequalities of outcome as part of its strategic decision-making process.
Following from the previous theme, it may not come as a surprise that the concept of due regard is also lacking a statutory definition. That being said, however, the concept is one which local authorities will already be familiar with as a result of the public sector equality duty. And I think, in light of the direction contained in the guidance, should feel comfortable about applying in a similar manner. Finally, in contrast to the public sector equality duty and the other duties which will be considered as part of this morning's presentation, there's no statutory requirement to report on the socio sorry to report on compliance with the socio-economic duty. That notwithstanding, the guidance does outline a number of practical steps that a local authority may wish to consider taking in order to demonstrate compliance. These include a process similar to the quality impact assessment, as well as publishing and reviewing outcomes and, and results on a regular basis. It would therefore appear that even in the absence of a statutory <laughs> requirement to report, there is a strong suggestion that the safest approach to compliance will be to adopt procedures which mirror the specific duties that apply under the public sector equality duty. Finally, whatever approach an, an authority decides to take to demonstrate compliance, I think it will, it will again be important to evidence how individuals and communities have been involved, both in the strategic decision-making process as well as a, as a wider development of the definitions and the best practices which surround the duty. That concludes my section, and I'll now hand you over to Jackie. I notice that I seem to be collecting glasses of water everywhere I go. I hope that wasn't yours. I was drinking, Charles. I want to be glass number three here. Okay, now of course I'm going to screw this up completely because I'm no use at it. Oh, that might help. Thank you, Kenzie. Uh, okay, <coughs> I'm going to talk a bit about um, new requirements under the Island Scotland Bill. Um, the slides in this will not at all match anything that I'm about to say because I thought you might want to relax and because we're talking about islands, take a look at some of the beautiful scenery that Scotland has to offer. I'm not guaranteeing that when I finish I'll be on the last slide either because the timing has been sorted out by Megan and others in our um, presentation team. Um, but you have lovely views from the windows here. You're about to have lovely views in front of you. So view this as being a relaxation session in which hopefully you'll also pick up some useful information. Now, I do hope this works. The Island Scotland Bill is intended to underpin the Scottish Government's objective of ensuring that there is a sustained focus across the public sector in Scotland to meet the needs of island communities, both now and in the future. Now, Orkney Council, Western Islands Council and Shetland Council have been campaigning for several years for greater powers for Scotland's islands, and their ambitions are set out in their publication, Our Islands, Our Future. I would commend it as good reading to anyone who's in the room. The bill stops short of introducing constitutional change, but it does introduce a number of very interesting measures. It makes provision for a national islands plan. That will be the responsibility of the Scottish Government. And rather than set out a proposed plan, the bill provides that following further consultation, first national islands plan should be laid before the Scottish Parliament within 12 months from the date on which the Act comes into force. So quite a challenge there for the Scottish Government. It also introduces duties placed upon relevant public bodies to have regard to island communities in exercising their functions. I'm just going to pause to look at this. Is that not a smashing shot of an angry sky over Shetland? Um, it also makes provision for electoral representation of island communities and, in addition, a licensing scheme in respect of marine development adjacent to islands, which was one of the set of powers that the islands communities were campaigning for in the Our Islands, Our Future document. I'm going to look at the second of those uh, proposals. So part three of the bill introduces uh, new duties in relation to island communities, and there are, there are two of them. The first is a duty for relevant public bodies to have regard to island communities, um, and that's referred to in section seven of the bill. And the second is the requirement to prepare island communities impact assessments and this requirement is in Section 8, and that's the means by which Section 7 will be complied with. 
There are two ancillary duties contained in the bill. The first is that in doing these things, uh, relevant public authorities must have regard to guidance which will be issued by the Scottish ministers. So that will be statutory guidance and there will be a clear expectation that it will be followed. And the second ancillary duty is a reporting duty, so they have to report on compliance with that Section 7 duty. So what does Section 7 say? Section 7 says that a relevant authority must have regard to island communities when carrying out its functions. And relevant authorities are listed in the schedule to the bill. Now, that list is not limited to local authorities. It's a very long list of public authorities. Mm -hmm. It includes health boards, Children's Hearing Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, HIE, the Scottish Police and Fire Authorities, and a number of regulators, including SEPA, um, the Scottish Housing Regulation and the SSSC. And that list can be added to from time to time or varied by the Scottish ministers. But the local authorities listed in the bill, unsurprisingly, are Argyll and Butte, the Western Isles, Highland Council, North Ayrshire Council, Orkney Council and Shetland Council. But I think it's important in the context of the best slide of them all, isn't it? Um, I think it's, in, it's important in the context of partnership working that other public bodies have an awareness of the requirements of the bill and when it's enacted the Act on the authorities that are listed in the schedule to the Act. You have to understand um, what this uh, Act means for the decision-making processes of the authorities to which the bill once enacted will apply. For the purposes of the bill, an island community is defined as a community which consists of two or more individuals, all of whom permanently inhabit an island, so it can be as little as two individuals. Um, there is a caveat which it has to be based on a common interest, identity or geography, and it did have to chuckle when you look at the definition of an island for the purposes of the bill, it has to be above water at high tide, which I thought was quite interesting for something that has to be permanently inhabited, I thought it would kind of go on without saying. So, <clears throat> the duty applies to all functions undertaken by relevant public authorities, all functions undertaken by local authorities. So, this requirement has the same scope as the public sector equality duty that's set out in section 149 of the Equality Act 2010. Section 8 uh, sets out the duty of a relevant authority to prepare island community impact assessments. And these are required whenever a relevant authority <clears throat> is considering a policy, a strategy or a service, which in the opinion of that authority is likely to have an effect on an island community which is significantly different from its effect on other communities, including other island communities, in the area in which the authority exercises its functions. So you can see from that that there is initial judgment required as to whether the effect of a policy, strategy or service will affect an island community differently. And the test as to whether or not an impact assessment is required is whether or not that effect will be significantly different. Um, there will be guidance issued under this Act, as I've said. Um, listening to, to, to Kenzie's presentation, it reminded me to mention that policy, strategy and service are not defined within the legislation, but it is likely that the guidance that is issued will reflect the guidance that has been issued in relation to the social economic duty, and that when you're talking about a strategy, it will be a strategy as defined within that guidance. What the bill means by other communities, well, the definition is limited to those communities within a local authority area, but the concept is different for other relevant authorities that are not local authorities and who operate on a national basis. So, for example, Scottish Enterprise will have to carry out a very different assessment from, for example, Western Isles. And the duty applies not just to the formulation of a policy strategy or an approach to service delivery, it also applies to the delivery and redevelopment of the policy, strategy or service. So it's not limited to a snapshot in time. It's an ongoing responsibility, an ongoing requirement. I don't know if it's possible to just flick back to that slide that was up on the screen a moment ago. Because yep. I'd like to pause on that one. So I wanted to make the point that the duty under the Island Bill as it currently is framed is not a jury guard duty, it's just a duty to have regard. So, as presently rewarded, the requirement at section 7 is to have regard to island communities, not to have jury guard to island communities, which is, for example, the case with the public sector equality duty and the case with the social economic duty. 
And you'll all know that there is a fair body of case law in and around what is meant by jury guard and when you have to have jury guard to certain things. But it seems to me highly unlikely that the Scottish Government intends that a less onerous duty is going to be imposed here. And perhaps clarity will be provided by the statutory guidance that will follow the enactment of the bill, or there may be further amendments to the bill before it's enacted to, to clarify that. So, turning on to the question of community impact assessments, well, what has to be in them? Well, they must include a description of the likely significant different effect of the policy, strategy or service on the island community. And it must assess the extent to which the authority considers that such a policy, strategy or service can be developed or delivered Attention, in such a please. manner. Attention, please. This is the test of the fire and voice alarm system. There is no need to take any action. That means just stay where you are. And there will be more voices. They'll come back and reassure you even further shortly. Okay. So, as I've said, the authority must um, look at ways um, look at ways of developing or delivering the service policy or strategy. Attention, please. Attention, please. Fire has been reported in the building. It hasn't really. Please leave the building immediately by the nearest exit. Do not use the lifts. This is not an excuse for you to get away. <coughs> they come back in a minute and tell us everything's fine, don't they? Yeah. So you have to look at whether they can improve or mitigate for island communities the outcomes that result from the introduction and ongoing delivery of a policy, strategy or service. So implicitly, relevant authorities aren't precluded from introducing policy, strategies or services that may have less favourable outcomes for island communities, but they must be able to justify their rationale and demonstrate they've considered how to mitigate any less favourable impacts. I think it's safe to keep going. There will be another and, yeah. So the, the, the bill has specific provisions where uh, a relevant authority decides not to prepare an impact assessment. So it looks at the policy, the strategy or the service delivery mechanism and it says we don't think it's going to have a significantly different effect on the island community. And this was introduced by an amendment to the bill at section 8.4. So where an authority decides that it's not going to prepare an island impact assessment in respect of a policy, strategy or service, it has to publish its reasons for that decision. Now, it remains to be seen whether the guidance will shed some light on how this is to be done. But it seems to me that that publication process doesn't have to be onerous. For example, the explanation could be set out in the council or committee report that introduces a new policy, strategy or, or service, where that report is itself published online. But where a significant policy, service or strategy change is introduced by the, through the exercise of delegated authority, the thought will have to be given as to how any decision not to undertake an impact assessment might be published. Now, that's not, not going to be an issue for every local authority, but will be perhaps an issue for local authorities that have quite flat management structures and where there's a significant effect of delegation to officers. And this mechanism is entitled to provide for greater scrutiny of such decisions in addition to scrutiny of impact assessments themselves where they have been produced. So in order to uh, comply with the duty at section 7, the way that relevant authorities will do that, in the case where an authority must produce an island impact assessment is by obviously preparing that assessment, or in any other case, so where they've decided not to produce one, um, taking such other steps as the authority considers appropriate. So, if a relevant authority concludes that the likely effect of a policy, strategy or service will be different for an island community but not significantly different, the authority may still take steps to address the impact of the policy, although it will of course still be required to publish its reasons for not having carried out an impact assessment. How to demonstrate compliance is left to the discretion of the authority, but it's difficult to conceive of compliance in respect of significant change that doesn't specifically involve consultation with islands' communities. And like much of what we're seeing in terms of new legislation, there's a reporting requirement provided for within the bill. This is us being told it's okay. Attention, please. Attention, please. The test of the fire and voice alarm system has now been completed. So if you've all been sitting on edge wondering whether it was real or not, you now know it isn't. 
So the reporting requirement very quickly. Relevant authorities must publish information about the steps they've taken to comply with Section 7, and they can do so at intervals up to a maximum of a year, and they have discretion as to the means of publication. Again, that may be an area that's covered by the statutory guidance. But that duty sits over and above the Section 7 duty and the Section 8 duty. It requires the drawing together of information to be published on a standalone basis so that the public can scrutinise the overall cumulative approach that has been taken by relevant authorities towards meeting the needs of violence communities. So just then, a quick word about challenge. In relation to non-compliance, any challenge by an interested party would be limited to judicial review. But it seems to me that the discretion that's available to relevant authorities may make any such challenge a bit of an uphill struggle. But I think thinking about it in terms of challenges to look at this new piece of legislation in the wrong way. The duties under the Island Bill, once it's enacted, may also be seen as the means by which the exercise of discretion by relevant authorities in relation to policy strategies and service delivery is underpinned by their duty to consider the impact of the decision-making on islands' communities, which reflects, at the very least, the ambitions of the island councils that were set out in the document that I've referred to at the beginning, <coughs> Our Islands, Our Future. Okay, I've finished with this particular slide just as a not-so-subtle reminder that um, on Friday of this week we will see uh, WW100, which is the um, uh, war memorial service that will take place on the um, Isle of Islay. And I raise it in particular because um, I've got a number of friends who work for Guy Island Butte Council who have been putting a lot of work into making sure that this uh, service is not just a success, um, but that actually reflects um, the sacrifices that have been made um, by generations of young people um, fighting in successive world wars. A bit of a sombre note, but I thought it was something worthwhile drawing to your attention. So, moving on to something a little different. But again, looking at some new duties that have been imposed on Scottish local authorities. I'm going to look at new reporting duties under the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. Oops. All children have rights. My children have told me this for, for many years. <laughs> I'd like to remind them now that they're up and about a wee bit that um, parents have rights as well. Like, get out of my house at some point in the future. <laughs> so... I'm going to look at the reporting duties of local authorities under Part 1 of this Act, which is concerned with the rights of the child and how local authorities are performing in relation to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, at times, this convention, I think, can seem a bit distant, but I think it's a, a very important convention, and um, although this does introduce new reporting duties for local authorities, personally speaking, I think it's a shift in the dire right direction and for Scotland as a country as the whole. As you will all know, the Convention isn't directly incorporated into domestic law, but the principles of the Convention do guide domestic law in practice. Um, it's often referred to by the courts for interpreting obligations um, imposed by human rights and other legislation. And with a bit of a Brexit caveat, um, in addition to its status as an international treaty which is legally binding in the UK, the Convention also has a, more, um, a, a degree of more direct legal effect in the UK's legal system through the Human Rights Act. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights takes note of the Convention in the context of its interpretation of the European Convention on Human Rights, and the UK courts are required by the Human Rights Act 1998 to take account of the jurisprudence of that court, and the UK government is, of course, bound, and the Scottish government bound by its judgments in cases against the UK. But as I've said, the Convention hasn't been incorporated into domestic uh, law and therefore it's not directly justiciable in the UK courts, which means that an individual can't go to a UK court to complain about a breach of any of the rights that are enshrined in the Convention. So, does anything within the Children and Young Persons Act change the status of the Convention in Scotland? I'm not going to go into any detail about any of the rights that are enshrined in the Convention. You can read those at Will. This is just a slide that's been prepared by a children's rights organisation which kind of sets some of them out in user-friendly language for children and young people. 
But there are a number of convention rights that are particularly relevant to functions of local authorities. And they include, for example, Article 7, um, which is concerned with the right of the child to know and be cared for by his or her parents. Very important in the context of child protection, child care. Um, Article 24, which enshrines the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health. Um, and Article 27, which recognises the right of every child to a standard of living adequate for the child's physical, mental, spiritual, moral and social development, which is, of course, not just relevant to what I'm talking about here, but also to the social economic duty that Kenzie was speaking about earlier. So, now buzzing, the, <laughs> the reporting duty, um, what is it? Um, I think before looking at what local authorities are required to do, it's, it's important to look at what the Act says about the Scottish Ministers. And Section 1 of the Act imposes a duty on the Scottish Ministers to keep under consideration whether there are any steps that they could take which might secure better or further effect in Scotland of the Convention requirements. So they've got a duty to think about improvement. And if they consider that it's appropriate to do so, they're under a duty to take any of the steps identified by that consideration. So they've got a duty to do the things that they think are appropriate. And in complying with those duties, the Scottish ministers must take into account um, the relevant views of children of which the Scottish ministers are aware. Section 1.3 of the Act provides that the ministers must promote public awareness and understanding of the rights of children. Um, now, when the bill was making its way through Parliament, <coughs> the Scottish <laughs> Government's position was that these new obligations um, provided a, a, a route for individuals to test in the domestic courts how the ministers have implemented the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I, I think that the, the vagueness of the duties that are imposed on, on the ministers make that a bit doubtful. But turning now to local government, um, it's implicit from the provisions of the Act that one of the measures the Scottish Government uh, considers necessary in order that it complies with its own Section 1 duties is to have public authorities report on how they are making progress towards the Convention. So it's introduced a reporting duty. That's imposed by Section 2 of the Act and applies to all Scottish local authorities. <clears throat> authorities can uh, report jointly, and the most obvious there might be that health boards and local authorities um, report together with regard to issues such as how they're making progress in child health and child care. The means of publication is at the discretion of the authority, but the government has introduced um, non-statutory guidance <clears throat> and um, it suggested that you may wish to publish how you've progressed as part of your children's services plan. I'll just make one point. It's important to note that this reporting duty applies not just to local authorities. It can also apply to local authority-owned companies. So it may to apply to an alio that's wholly owned by a local authority, regardless of the activities that are undertaken by that alio. So when does it apply? Every three years. First report due in April 2017 to March 20. So the reporting period has started only just and you must publish it as soon as practical after the 31st of March. Yep. <clears throat> the Scottish Government has introduced guidance on part one of the Act. Uh, the guidance is intended to provide a framework, but not the framework, for how reporting is carried out, so it can be departed from. And as the Act says very, very little about how you might comply with your duties, the guidance might be regarded as a good starting point for public authorities trying to work out what has, uh, what's expected of them. Is this buzzing because of time, Megan? No, batteries. Batteries, OK. <laughs> So the guidance contains advice on best practice and how local authorities can discharge the duty. It includes a suggested reporting framework for local authorities that are not starting from scratch. You already hold a significant amount of information which is relevant to these reporting requirements. You do a lot of what the Act requires already in the context of community planning and in developing mm -hmm. strategies, policies and services that are relevant to children and young people. Okay. I think I'll have to just move back when I was a bit thrown by the buzzing. <clears throat> so 
So, in terms of how you go about reporting then, the guidance suggests that before preparing a children's rights report, you might want to consider developing a framework modelled around um, the framework that has been already developed um, for monitoring compliance with the Convention. There is a Convention Assessment Framework um, and it is specifically applicable to developing children's rights reports. Now, the approach that's been adopted under that framework is to look at clusters of rights under the Convention. So it looks at how the articles under the Convention have been grouped. So it will look at, for example, clusters that focus on family, life, health and education. And the guidance suggests that you might want to map the progress you've made against each cluster that is relevant to local authority functions. And I think that the cluster approach is actually quite useful because not everything within the Convention will be relevant to everybody that's covered by the Act. It will help focus your mind on what's relevant to your area of activity, to your services and to your functions. So the approach fits well with how local authorities are structured. <clears throat> what the guidance says is that in each case, the local authority is expected to report on what steps it's taken, what those steps have achieved, and what further action is required by who and how this will be achieved. So what the Scottish Government is anticipating is not just a progress report. It's looking at a self-assessment followed by an action plan. Um, this is also, I think, will also be expected of persons having an interest in children's rights, including the Children and Young Persons Commissioner. In addition, the guidance says that the Scottish Government will expect that children's rights reports will demonstrate that the relevant authority has a commitment to involving children and young people in preparing children's rights reports that they'll have regard to child wellbeing indicators developed as part of the Getting It Right for Every Child approach and other links with the Convention. It also suggests that you should have regard to the Child Rights and Wellbeing Impact Assessment originally developed for the Scottish Government um, and reports and other frameworks that the Government has brought forward. And that in particular framework is included as an appendix to the guidance. It seems to me the safest route would be a, to adopt a similar approach to that that has been developed by the Scottish ministers. And finally, it says there should be a link between your Part 1, Section 2 duty to report on children's rights and your Part 3 duties to report um, and to sorry, develop children's services plans. Now, the battery may now be dead because it stopped buzzing and there are no numbers on it, so <laughs> no, it's not. Just finally, um, some of the key considerations that are touched on upon the guidance in terms of the reporting duty. I've already mentioned, but I'll just stress that engaging with young people is considered to be an essential component in the preparation of children's uh, rights reports. So local authorities will be required to consider at an early stage how children and young people will be meaningfully involved in the production of these reports. And you have to do that because it says so in the Act. And approaches to involving young people are also considered in the guidance. But the good news, a bit like Kenzie said with her presentation, is that the guidance acknowledges that there's probably no need to reinvent the wheel. Mechanisms are already currently employed by local authorities for consulting with and obtaining the views of young people. And that those should be appropriate for the purpose of the reporting obligations under the Children and Young People Act. The guidance stresses that formats, both for collecting and collating information and reporting should be accessible to children and young people, families and other stakeholders. And I'll just remind you that your duties under the Equality Act are applicable here, as well as giving consideration to what format is likely to be ac accessed or accessible by young people and how their interests might actually be engaged. Um, I've done a series of seminars on um, a lot more detail in relation to children's rights recently with the former Children's Rights Commissioner Tam Bailey and one of the things that he pulled out was that young people quite often complain that stuff is put online by public bodies and that they don't all have access to computers but as Tam did point out most of them are sitting at that point in time with a smartphone in their hands and that there has to be a way of engaging with young people to ensure that they understand that they can actually use these things by using you know, this, this piece of equipment they have in their hand day on day basis and if your children, if those of you who have them are anything like mine or old enough to have them, Charles, um, they will have a, a, a 
phone in their hand at all times, and these smartphones can access this type of information, but it does make you think about how the information can be presented in a format that doesn't involve someone sitting, scrolling through screeds and screeds and screeds of information on a phone just to get the information that's really important, the information that they need to know about. And just finally, um, the format of the report um, must provide opportunities for scrutiny and feedback, including by children and young people. So there has to be a, an active attempt at getting that feedback, particularly from that interest group. Finally, the publication, well, the publication of your report is, is a matter for you. I would just say that reporting is not about reporting to the Scottish Government. There are no powers um, available to the Scottish Government in the event of a default by a local authority in terms of performing. But I am aware of um, engagement with the Children's Commissioner that this is a, an area that he is particularly interested in. What the view expressed by the Commissioner is that the duty imposed by local authorities under this Act or Part 1 of this Act are essentially reporting duties, but in order to produce a good report, it will be necessary to undertake good work that produces good outcomes, goes without saying. So although there are no default provisions in favour of the Scottish Ministers, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And uh, I imagine that umbrella groups with an interest in children's rights, and in particular the Scottish Commissioner, because he's told me he has, will be interested in what is published by local authorities in response to this duty. And I would imagine it would be a concern for any local authority if a report of poor quality was to be the trigger for a special investigation by the Children's Commissioner under Section 5 of the Act. So you could be doing a whole host of very important, very useful things, but if they're not being reported appropriately, you could still find yourself under additional scrutiny. Just going back to what I said at the beginning, for me, it's difficult at this time to see how the provisions of Part 1 of the Act will give rise to proceedings in the domestic courts, either against the Scottish Government or against local authorities. And I do know that that has um, led to some disappointment being expressed in some quarters um, about the limited effect of the Act. Again, umbrella groups and the Children's Commissioner, I think, will continue to place the government under pressure to do more. But I predict that a pretty cautious um, approach will be adopted by the Scottish Government in terms of placing further responsibilities on public authorities to ensure compliance with the Convention. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Charles Livingston, uh, also a partner in our Government Regulation and Competition team um, and based here in our Glasgow office. Um, so I'm going to chair the uh, Q&A uh, aspect of this session. Um, so Jackie and Kenzie, if you want to go back up to the podium so everybody who's live streaming what... Okay, let's see if we have any questions first. I, I at least have a question. Um, there is a roving mic again just for the benefit of those who are watching us on live stream. So does anybody have a question? Oh, everyone's very confident. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll ask the first question then. Um, it's just building on that, that last point that you made, Jackie, about the Children and Young Persons Act um, and the, the scope for challenge, scope for litigation, um, not just because we're fishing for work or anything, but um, the other duties that we've been talking about, um, do we see much scope for litigation arising out of those? I think for both the socioeconomic and the duty of candour, um, it's, as Jackie had said, for the duties that she covered, it would be by way of a judicial review for those duties. Um, an individual can, for example, there's some discussion on the socio-economic duty whether that should have been included as um, a particular category, a uh, protected characteristic under the Equality Act, so that a person could um, raise an action for d discrimination on that basis. Um, it doesn't fall within one of the protected characteristics, so it, it would just be judicial review that would be the option open to challenge. Yeah. I think um, if you look back to challenges that have been taken under the public sector equality duty. We've got to be conscious of the fact that parties may take challenges under public sector equality duty, potentially social economic duty, and potentially that um, duty to uh, have regard to island communities. Whether or not they have a genuine interest in whether or not that duty has been complied with. 
I think it would be open to other parties to take challenges on the basis that a local authority simply hasn't complied with a statutory duty before it introduces, for example, a service change, where that service change might, for example, have an impact on the commercial interests of a third party. So it's important to remember that these duties will be homed in and not necessarily by, for example, individuals on, within an island community who are concerned about the way in which changes have been made to the education service. They could also be honed in on by third parties who have got an interest in how changes have been made to how, for example, school transport is procured. So they do have wider implications. Okay. Yep, question at the back there. Um, and if you, uh, if you want, uh, if you can just say who you are and where you're from. Well, I'm Andrew McLaughlin from Remshire Council. It's more of a practical question, so you might not be able to answer it, but it would be interested if anyone in the room's had thoughts in relation to duty of candour. Under reg regulations, the duty is triggered when it's the opinion of a registered health professional who's not involved with the incident that harm has occurred. And as you've said, the definition of harm is very, very wide. That's quite easy to understand in a health context where you are in a hospital or something happens, you go to a doctor next door and you say, has the duty of candour occurred here? But what, what's your views on practicalities in terms of social work? Like if a child, say, gets a, runs into a door, gets a black eye in a children's home, which is going to last long in 28 days, you go running to the GP, you know, appreciate this is not something you might think from a legal point of view, but if anyone in the room has. possible useful just to look at the definition of, of harm. So yeah. it's subsection 4 of section 21 that sets out the outcomes that will be treated as harm. Um, so it yeah, it can include it could, yeah. experiencing pain or psychological harm. Yeah, I, th I think that you've probably touched on quite an important point. Um, the duty of candour doesn't necessarily equate to the equivalent of an apology. It's really about explaining fairly candidly how things have occurred. Um, I know that's maybe not answering your question, but I can see the practical difficulty in the situation that you've been discussing. Um, it's not likely to be the case that every time a child runs into a door that a health professional is brought in to, to voice an opinion. Um, but the health professional is really concerned with, has, there, has the person experienced pain or psychological harm. Um, there's a secondary set of considerations behind that about how that was allowed to happen. Um, so I think really the health professional will be departing the scene at the end of answering question one, and it's really then for the service provider to deal with question two about how it happened and whether it should have happened or whether things could have been done to prevent it happening. But I can't see a health professional being drafted in every time there is an incident which causes someone pain or psychological harm. I think it will depend upon the magnitude. I'm just noting it also states in, um, in the Act that the, the pain or harm experience has to be for a continuous period of at least 28 days. So that the example you gave there presumably would take that out with the ambit of the Act, but I can still see the point that, that you're making. What about children bring arms and foster care and stuff? Correct. Unfortunately, more rightfully than not, and quite often the child will be injured and how this has happened, but you cannot trigger it without going to a registered health professional, so it's just yeah. really... It's, a, it's an additional burden, and yeah. it does suggest that there will be an additional cost, if not a direct cost, at least an indirect cost to the public sector in complying with this duty. I think where the duty of candour is likely to be of significant concern is where it affects other service providers, not just local authorities, and I imagine that in the care sector, um, it, it will be... It will require a, a fair amount of training. I don't think they're quite ready for it yet. Um, but it all ripples back, doesn't it, to commissioning authorities? Because you'll be keen to ensure that service providers that you're using to provide care services, for example, to you know, adults with incapacity, are actually not just aware of this duty, but are actually giving effect to it. And whether that becomes one of the performance indicators when you're procuring these services will have to be seen, but it may well be. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks very much. Well, we are uh, pretty much on time for our next session. Uh, so if I can ask our next panel to come up. Um, and in the meantime, everybody just thank me in joining, uh, thank, join me in thanking even uh, Jackie and Kenzie. So our next session is on planning reform. Um, our, 
we're delighted to be joined by Craig McLaren, who's a director of the Royal Town Planning Institute, and he's going to be speaking alongside uh, Karen Hamilton, who's a partner in our planning team. Um, so Craig is going to consider the main provisions of the Planning Scotland Bill and the key challenges that face planning authorities in relation to its implementation. Um, and Karen is then going to give a legal perspective on the delivery of infrastructure after those reforms have gone through. So, Craig. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation to, to speak today. Uh, I'll get 20 minutes, and what I really want to do is give you a broad overview of some of the key issues in the, the planning bill. I want to talk about five key issues and four things which aren't in the bill, which might be in the bill. So I'm going to have to speak either very quickly or do it quite succinctly and give you a broad overview. Hopefully it'll be the latter. Um, so, cutting to the chase... Um, that's it. Oh. So, cutting to the chase, where are we with the bill? Just to give you a bit of background. Um, as you'll know, a, planning, a bill goes through three stages. We're currently at stage one, um, where the local government committee has uh, led on a scrutiny of the, the planning bill, which was published in December last year by, by, by Scottish Government. Um, they have uh, undertaken a lot of evidence. Um, there's been about four or five different evidence sessions. Um, they've actually they had a, a workshop with people, which was quite unusual for a committee. They've been out to see different communities to get views from Peterhead, Airdrie, and somewhere else. So uh, I don't know what they, what they were talking about, but um, there was a, they were asking people about what their thoughts on the planning system was, which is a good thing. Um, and also the, the, um, uh, the Finance Committee and the Devolved Powers Committee also looked at it as well. I know the Local Government Committee are actually sitting this morning in private looking at their report on that. So we anticipate their report on the first stage to come out sometime very soon, I imagine next week. Um, and that will give us a clear indication as to their thoughts on how the bill uh, should progress. Um, However, um, we then go on to stage two, where there's amendments, and at this stage three, where, we'll, uh, where the, the bill should become an act. Um, the time scale is such that it's looking at that won't happen until September, uh, although this time scale, the time scale is still a bit of flux, um, so um, it, could be late, it could be even later than that. So they've taken a long time to scrutinise the bills, I suppose, the, the point I'm trying to make. However, the, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that um, that won't be the end of things. The bill itself is a very enabling bill. Um, it's only about 30, 40, 30, 38 clauses, I think it is, within it. Um, so there's going to be a hell of a lot of work after that in terms of regulations, in terms of policy, uh, and also in terms of a renewed national planning framework. The national planning framework has to be published every five years. Uh, they've actually pushed it back a year um, because of the, the, the bill, and it has to be published in June 2020. Um, and as I'll explain in a minute, the, the NPF is going to change quite considerably. So there's a lot of work to be done after the Acts actually come into position as well, uh, around lots of different things. So um, I want to talk about, say, um, five different things which are within the bill, which I think are important. I'm going to talk them very, very briefly and just tell you, I think, what the key provisions are. The first thing I really want to talk about is the national planning framework and, and, and regional planning. Um, national planning framework, as I said already, is going to change. Um, just now, the national planning framework is a spatial strategy, um, and it talks about the where. And we have Scot Scottish planning policy, which talks about the how and the why. Um, they're going to be combined. Uh, they, there's a provision in the, uh, the bill for that to happen. And that's going to be interesting. That's something we push for. We think we have something much more like a national development plan. And I think this is, that's going to, be, going to become much more like that. The other thing is um, Scottish Government is proposing to get rid of uh, strategic development plans, so they want a much more informal arrangement at, at, at regional level, um, as happens with things such as city-region deals. Um, and because of that, the national planning framework will technically become part of the local development plan as well. So there are some issues around that as to how that's going to work. Um, one of the issues we've got as an institute is, is the loss of um, strategic planning is something which we don't think will work. Um, there will be a duty for, uh, lo for local authorities to cooperate to, to build an evidence base uh, to help produce the national planning framework. We think that should go further, and there has to be something which gives a, something tangible which shows priorities um, and safeguards at a strategic level, perhaps something such as a, a key diagram, which we used to have in, in structure plans in the past, but something which can be a tangible thing which shows how those authorities have worked together, where their priorities are for investment, where their priorities are for growth, where, they should, where we should protect things, where we should consolidate, and also something which can be used to try and um, work across 
the horizontal um, uh, axis where you can make sure that planning links in much more effectively with infrastructure, with transport, through regional, tra regional transport partnerships, through city-region deals, um, because it, it's at that strategic level where a, a lot of those really important decisions can be made, um, which can have a big influence on things such as housing provision as well. So that's, that's the first thing I really want to talk about. Um, the second thing is um, local development plans. Um, there are a number of things we're going to change in the way the local development plans are produced and how they will work. Um, the first thing in terms of the, the process, that, that's a, a, a diagram that comes from Scottish Government on the existing process. That process is going to change. Um, the first thing is we're going to get uh, rid of uh, main issues reports, uh, which are done prior to the proposed plan at the moment. What will happen there is Scottish Government are asking for um, local authorities to work to produce a, a, an evidence report which looks at what the background to is, which they will publish uh, with the proposed plan. And there will, there will be a, a, a gate check introduced at that, pro that, that site where people will look at, um, probably a reporter from the, um, the uh, reporters unit, will look at um, if it's fit for purpose now to take things forward. So that's a new thing that's been introduced in terms of the process. The other important thing is they are going to change the life of development plans from a five-year cycle to a ten-year cycle, um, which uh, there are pros and cons. Of, I think we, we think it could be useful. There are provisions to amend the plan during that ten-year period if that's required through some form of major shock or through some monitoring exercise which shows you a policy has to change or if there's something else has to happen, like a, um, a local place plan, which I'll talk about later. But that 10-year cycle makes things much, uh, uh, makes local development plans something quite different. And I think the idea behind that is they move away from just producing development plans in an almost continuous cycle to actually produce the development plan, and that frees up maybe seven years or so to actually deliver the plan, which is where the, probably the weakness is in the system just now, the delivery side of it. And as part of that, there's a provision in, in, the, in the bill as well to, to move away from um, uh, action programmes, uh, to move away to delivery programmes, to try and put much more of a focus on the delivery aspects of the proposals which are within the plan as well. As to how they will work, we're not quite sure yet, and that'll come out in regulation. Um, another thing, uh, two things to mention about the, um, uh, the change in the local development plan process is uh, one, um, there's a provision to get rid of supplementary planning guidance. Um, which is interesting. Um, we're still trying to square how that's going to work, to be honest with you, because there's a lot of uh, useful detail goes into supplementary guidance which people need on particular issues. Um, so um, that's something we still need to tease out how that's, that's going to work as well. Another important thing is that there's, a, there's an emphasis on the link uh, between uh, the local development plan and things such as community plans and local outcome improvement plans, which is something we've all been trying to push for, I think, for some time now, where the, the development plan can almost be the spatial articulation of the, of the local improvement plan. And I think that's something we, we broadly welcomed as well. The um, third thing I want to mention is, um, is housing and infrastructure. And, and if any of you remember the genesis of the planning bill, there was a planning review, got about two years ago, it's back in the midst of time now, um, there was a planning review undertaken, and the, this was uh, commissioned by um, Alec Neil when he was uh, Cabinet Secretary, so that shows how long ago it was. Um, and the genesis for that essentially was they wanted to try and make sure the planning system was delivering housing. Um, so it was always felt that a key part of the, the planning bill would be about housing. The truth is that's not really come through in terms of what's been said, and that there isn't an awful lot in the the, um, the bill about housing. There are some things which I think may help, and which I'll touch upon, but it's not the sort of um, the golden thread which we thought might run through it. Um, so I think that maybe shows the problems and difficulty we have in trying to make sure that um, housing is actually delivered, and it's not just a planning issue, believe me. Um, so things I just want to touch on in that. Um, there is a provision to, for Scottish Government to implement an infrastructure levy, and I know Karen's going to talk about that in a bit more detail, so I'll not mention any more than that. Other than our view on that is, it's interesting, the, the modelling which we've seen for the infrastructure levy shows it's only going to bring in between 50 and 70 million pounds a year, which is about two and a half schools, which is not the transformational change which we anticipated. So uh, there are issues with that, but there is still a really important need to try and make sure that we can fund infrastructure. From what I, he I hear in talking to heads of planning and even talking to developers, it's infrastructure which is becoming the crux issue now. And if you're trying to develop, deliver new housing and you, nobody's got the money to deliver a school which is needed as part of that or a doctor's surgery or whatever, um, we need to crack that. And we have no way of doing that just now. 
And I'll talk a wee bit about something which is emerging on that at the end of my, my presentation. Um, the other thing is that the national planning framework is supposedly going to be taking a stronger view on housing, and it may well set national targets, um, which is something which might help things, but there's still a, there's still a bit about trying to make sure that c cascades down, um, and it's actually implemented at a local level. Um, there's very little in terms of local development plans in the bill on housing. The key thing which comes out of it is the idea of implementing uh, simplified development zones, which are a move forward from the there's ex two existing simplified planning zones. And these are places where you can put in place essentially a scheme which, uh, which, take, which puts a lot of the decision making up front and negates the need for a lot of decisions to be made around planning permissions, around listed building consent, around roads construction consent, and even around advertising consent um, within, uh, uh, within that, that, that to try and speed things up. There are currently, I think, four pilots going on looking at how, that, how they could work. And we think they're an interesting model. Um, again, the, the devil will be in the detail. There's quite a lot of detail in the bill around that. Um, but the other key thing is they need to be linked into the local development plan. They can't just spring up here, there and everywhere without having a, a planned uh, focus because they need to also make sure there's a focus in terms of investment and infrastructure uh, as well. So uh, that, that's where we are um, with, with housing um, in many ways. The um, fourth thing I want to talk about is a thing which is probably... Um, achieved um, most attention through the, the scrutiny um, in, in Parliament uh, on the bill. And that's the idea of introduce, introducing what are being called local place plans. And they, these are essentially um, new plans which can be uh, pulled together by communities which could become part of the local development plan. Um, the concept behind them is a good one, um, getting communities to try and look at their ideas and, and their thinking, uh, and for that to become part of the plan. There's very little detail in the bill as to how they will work. And, and that's deliberate from Scottish Government. They, they don't want to cover it in bureaucracy, and I, and I can understand that. But I think there's still a need for a bit more detail than what we've got in the bill. Um, they, they, they have to have regard to the local development plan uh, and the national planning framework. Um, but there, for me, there's a real issue with um, taking them forward in terms of sequencing. And so far, if there's a local development plan in place and a community decides it wants to produce its own local place plan for that area, how does that work if it contradicts the, um, the local development plan? Um, how, do, how do you make, how do you, or how do you work out what way to go on that? As I said, there are provisions in the bill for the local development plan to be updated and changed, which could be done, but there's an issue with trying to make sure that discussions take place in a, in a, in a fair way and that there's a clear idea as to where things are going. And one of my biggest worries from working for the, the, the planning profession is that we know there's quite a lot of mistrust from the public in planning, and if we don't sequence this properly and make sure that it becomes a positive and a constructive process and discussion, it could be seen as another way of people saying that's a planning system and disrepute is not listening to communities again. So there's quite a lot of work I think has to be done to look at the detail of how um, that process can be managed, how it can be sequenced um, and how it can be taken forward as well. Another issue with it for me, which isn't for the bill or the act, but which I think is important, is the idea as to how these local place plans will be resourced. Um, local communities um, could take them forward themselves. Um, but there's a danger they might not be taking account of the bigger, bigger picture in doing that. So I believe there's a need for some professional advice to help them to facilitate that process. Um, that costs money, um, and there's no provision anywhere for resources to do that. There was a big debate in the Finance Committee, which I took place, uh, I was involved in, which looked at how we can make that work. Um, and we've worked out that if you look at a charrette, for example, which might be a key part of our local place plan, that costs about £30,000. Um, if you're going to have five local place plans in each local authority, suddenly it starts hitting millions of pounds. So the real issue there is to make sure that these are resourced as well. Um, and if there is a, a need to prioritise that resource, where that should go, should it go in those areas where there's going to be most change, which could be more affluent areas, given some housing need and demand? Um, or should it go in those areas where there's, uh, there's less of an interaction with the planning service, some of the more deprived areas? So there's, there's quite a lot of debate, discussion and clarity needed to try and take that forward. And the, the, the final issue I want to talk about is really is performance uh, and resourcing. And... Um, just, I'm sure many of you will know this more than I will because I don't work at the coalface, but we're actually, I think, coming to a, almost a crisis position in terms of resource and planning in local authorities. 
We've done research, we've shown that we've, we've lost 23% of planning staff in the last seven years. Um, that's taken £40 million out of planning budgets. Um, we've also found that the average amount of money invested by uh, in a, lo in a local authority budget in development planning and development management is 0.44% of the total budget, which even made me wince. Uh, I thought it was low, but I didn't think it was that low. Uh, and that's a predicted to go down to 0.4% next year. So there's a real issue with resourcing in terms of, of planning. Um, the other thing is um, planning fees uh, through work undertaken by Heads of Planning Scotland showed that uh, planning fees on average only cover 63% of the actual costs of processing a planning application. So you're already in deficit. So there's an issue, a contextual issue around all the things within the, uh, the planning bill as to how that's going to be undertaken under those, those increasingly difficult resource constraints. There are a number of things, or there's, there's a clause in the bill which opens up some, uh, some, the ability for planning authorities to charge for some of their services, which I think is interesting. It's quite open-ended as far as I can understand, but I know a number of local authorities are looking at the idea of charging, charging for pre-application advice, for example. Uh, currently, that's a bit of a grey area, and as far as I can understand, only Highland Council and Fife Council charge for it. Um, but it could be an income stream for a number of local authorities. Um, the feedback I get on people who have used it is that it can be very useful because uh, the fact you've got it, you're, you're paying for that service means you have to get all those different services in the room and you get clarity on the way in which the decision's going and what needs to be done to, to take that forward. So that's something which could be looked at. I know local authorities are looking at other ways of making money as well, things like signing off conditions, charges for that. There's lots of other things which have been kicked around just now. So uh, that's one to watch for the future as well. The other really important thing in the, um, in the bill is the, um, the fact that uh, it puts on the face of the bill the need for planning authorities to report on an annual basis on their performance. This was something which we know came in at the very last minute as the bill was being prepared. And I think it's something the Minister's keen to show, particularly developers and applicants, that he's taking performance seriously. So this idea of this, uh, this annual report is, is something which we think is fine. It sort of happens just now anyway. Planning authorities have to publish a, an annual planning performance framework. But the fact it's now uh, going to be in statute, it's interesting. And the other thing is there's a provision in the bill to put in place what's called a planning performance coordinator who will work to uh, and will have powers to assess the performance of planning authorities. And have got all these powers to access buildings and there's all these different fines if you don't let them in, if you don't give them the right information, which are a wee bit over the top in my, my personal opinion, but um, that's the way it goes. Um, but that, that planning performance coordinator will have a key role in assessing performance and, agree, and looking at, um, at where particular authorities perhaps have to have something done. That's not defined exactly what it is. There is a provision uh, for the planning penalty clause to come in place, which can allow ministers to uh, vary planning fees. So it could be mean a reduction in planning fees, for example. Um, we think that the idea of a coordinator is, is actually not a bad idea uh, to show that performance is important. We are slightly worried about the lack of detail, again, in the bill about it. We think it has to be an independent person, has to be pump, uh, appointed through the public bodies commissioning process, uh, appointments process. Um, and we also think we need to make sure that when they are doing that assessment, um, well, two things. One, there has to be some clarity in what we mean by good performance. And that's something which will come through guidance and advice later. Uh, and we've struggled with that for a number of years. Um, our view is it can't just be how quickly you process a planning application. It's a much more rounded and holistic view of the outcomes which are produced at the end of it. So there's an issue there. Um, and and this, this, the... Um, the other thing is about the, the idea of the, um, uh, the performance coordinator, um, what, what, what role they have in, 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 per, in actually improving performance as well. So it's not just about assessing. It has to be done in a way. It's not just going in there with a big hammer and saying this is rubbish. It's going in and saying, well, well, let's see how we can actually support people to improve that, that performance as well. Um, that's in, that's incredibly, incredibly important. And as part of that process, there's a thing about the ownership of performance. And the way the, uh, the bill is uh, drafted just now is very much about planning authorities being the sole arbiters of performance. Our argument is that planning authorities are absolutely key to performance. However, they also depend on other organisations in, in, in undertaking their duties on that, including government, including government agencies, including applicants and communities as well. So we want to try and do something where we actually widen that ownership of performance as well. Um, 
So that's uh, that's a thing we're taking forward as we progress the, the bill. The um, just briefly, conscious of time, uh, I mentioned I want to talk about four things which aren't in the bill, which may become part of the bill, um, uh, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of noise going on around some things um, which weren't in the bill, and a lot of stuff were discussed at, in the committee sessions which weren't in the bill as well, which was a wee bit bizarre. But uh, hey, that's the way it goes. Um, one of the key things which you may have heard of is um, there is uh, a number of organ there are a number of organisations who are keen to use the bill as a means to change the way uh, in which we deal with rights of appeal. They are keen to introduce what they call a fair right of appeal or a third party right of appeal, where community organisations have a right of appeal against decision. As you know just now, the only right of appeal was with the with the applicant. Um, so they're pushing that, and I know a number of the political parties are very interested in that, certainly the Labour Party, the Greens and the Liberal Democrats are currently supporting that. The Conservatives haven't made their mind up as yet, as far as I can gather, uh, and the SNP are against it. We don't believe it will work. Um, our, our view is that um, there actually are only two rights um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the planning system. There's, there are two interests. There's a private interest who's promoting the application, and there's a public interest. And planning authorities and government work in the public interest. So if you added a third party to that, that would make it unbalanced. Um, and we also want to move away from a situation where the, um, the perverse situation, whereby the key means in which people actually engage with the planning system is when they, they want to talk about something they don't want to happen in their area through objecting to a planning application. We have a much more front-loaded system where you get people talking about what they want for their area and in a constructive and a positive way, and that's used to try and create a dialogue throughout the process with all the stakeholders and players involved, including communities. So, but that's something which will undoubtedly, I'm sure there'll be amendments put forward on the bill from, from organisations on that. Um, the other thing is, uh, and the linked into that, is, is the idea of a purpose for planning. The, uh, the, the, the bill just now um, comes in the back of the 19... 97 Act and the 2006 Act. It's a bit of a mess. There's no consolidation planned, as far as I can understand. Um, so, um, there's, for me, there's, there's, there's an issue um, in terms of trying to show what planning is all about. Uh, so, there's a, there's a lot of organisations, including ourselves, looking at the idea of putting a, a purpose for planning in, in, the, in the Act or the Bill. Um, lots of organisations go on to put these very, very complicated purposes in. Our idea is to do something very simple, more or less to say the purpose of planning is to make decisions on land in the long-term public interest. Full stop. Um, be interested to hear people's views on that. Um, we've had some interesting discussions within our membership on it. I think the key thing for me would, would give some clarity to what we're trying to do. I think it would help focus the way people actually deal with things. Um, and I also think it would uh, give added um, credibility to the idea that local authorities are working in the public interest and therefore stop the clamour for third, third party rights as well. Two other things just to mention briefly. I'm conscious of only about a minute left. Um, one is there was a lot of discussion as well about land and land value uplift where you actually make sure that the state or the local authorities, however, can actually um, gain from any uh, value uplift from a plan permission given to a piece of land. Um, I know some people have been interested in looking at that, if there's a provision we can put into there as part of the, uh, part of the, the, the bill. Um, I think we're interested in that as a concept. We're not sure the planning bill is the mechanism to do it. The, we've been told there may be a compulsory purchase uh, bill next year and that might be the way to look at that um, because there's many different models to that and I think we have to test them. The worst thing we could do is put something in rather hurriedly which can be, complete, could be a complete mess. And the final thing I just want to mention before I finish up is um, something which we're promoting, which uh, I thought I'd use the opportunity to advertise it. Um, and one of the, the amendments we will be making to the bill is the, uh, uh, putting in a provision that every local authority has to have a statutory chief planning officer. Um, and this is not a bid to get a, a planning professional on the corporate management table for every organisation, although that would be lovely. But it's essentially trying to have a named person, if I can use that term, um, in, a, in a local authority who the corporate management team has to engage with early on key issues around asset management, on key issues around um, policy and investment decisions as well, so that we can make sure that spatial aspect can be looked at, so we can make sure that the decisions looked at not just in the short term, but the medium and longer term, um, and how we can make sure that what the implications are for something, not just in terms of that immediate geography, but the geographies and places beyond that as well. So um, we are looking for support for, for that to happen as well. We think it could actually bring a lot of value um, to the way in which local authorities are run and way community planning partnerships could, could work as well. 
on on that hopefully positive note I'll finish there Okay, thanks Craig and morning everyone and a seamless transition um, I'm now going to round off this session um, on planning reform hopefully the yep there we go um, so Craig has given you a, a run through of the, the key planks of, of reform and focusing in on some of the implications for local authorities. I'm now going to focus on the infrastructure elements um, of the reform and really trying to think about some of the practicalities for, I suppose, the lawyers and the, the planners in the room, which I think probably covers the majority of you. Um, so. Why the focus then on, on infrastructure? What, what has the problem been? Well, you had a sense from Craig already, I think, that the funding and delivery of infrastructure has been um, one of Scottish Government's key concerns throughout this process, and that's come out through the various sort of publications um, that we've had from the early stages of the initial review. And I think the barriers to delivery as you know, are complex and, and varied and probably overlapping. So we have things like difficulties in capacity planning around education. We have problems of coordinating various stakeholders and trying to get alignment um, between the programming processes of various organisations. And there can be development viability issues, particularly where we're trying to and look at bringing forward development and regeneration um, in the poorer, poorer areas of the country and can that development um, carry a heavy load in terms of contributions and just obviously constrained resources generally, it's a, a continuing theme. But there's also been a level of dissatisfaction, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, around the current mechanisms. So really thinking about Section 75s, how those operate, um, constant complaints about delays to planning permissions actually being issued at the end of the day, and I suppose a general unwieldiness around planning agreements um, and perhaps the consistency or perhaps lack of consistency um, as between how, how various authorities deal with different things um, in terms of a, a Section 75 process. On top of all of that, we also had um, in, the, in the course of last year the ELSIC decision, which I think has added to the headaches that everyone's been grappling with. So I think on that note, um, I thought it would be useful just to say a few words about ELSIC. We could have a, a seminar, I think, devoted to that issue in itself, but just to remind everyone in the room of um, the, the key issues identified from, from that case before then moving on to think about the, the idea of the infrastructure levy um, and and the benefits of that should that be brought forward. So just to remind everyone, the Elzik case um, made it all the way to the Supreme Court, no less, uh, before we, we got the final judgment last October. And the case concerned the lawfulness of supplementary planning guidance, which was adopted by the Strategic Planning Authority for the Aberdeen City and Shire area in respect of developer contributions and it related in particular to a strategic transport fund which had been set up. So the approach taken by that guidance was to collect contributions from developers across the area, essentially a large area, which were then pooled together in the fund, so in the, the STF, for the purposes of a package of strategic transport measures. So the money was paid into the fund and it would be put towards all of the named um, transport interventions which were identified in the guidance. That SPG was then challenged by a developer who had had to enter into Section 75, like many others, requiring a contribution to the fund. Now, the court ultimately found, as a matter of fact, that the development which was subject to that planning agreement would have no more than a trivial connection, that was the phrase that was used, to the transport measures in question, or at least some of them to which uh, that developer was having to contribute. 
And in those circumstances, the planning obligation, so the Section 75, couldn't be a material consideration in the determination of the application because there wasn't a suitable connection between the two. And if it wasn't a material consideration, then the planning authority couldn't require the developer to enter into that Section 75 as a precursor or precondition to granting planning permission. So on that basis, the approach taken within the SPG was found to be unlawful and the supplementary planning guidance itself was set aside. So what has that meant for planning authorities? Well, it's probably fair to say that since the ELSIC decision, planning authorities generally have been more cautious than they perhaps already were about tackling strategic infrastructure requirements through the developer contribution system. And in addition, where authorities have been trying to take the plunge, um, you know, so take it, taking on board the difficulties of ELSIC, um, a number of authorities nonetheless trying to move ahead with guidance um, to get things going in their areas, they are naturally finding that their proposals are subject to a very high degree of scrutiny in light of ELSIC. Um, from developers and other stakeholders who are essentially then assessing the approach taken to see if that sufficient connection test is met. So is there more than a trivial connection between the developments which are being asked to contribute and measures to which contributions are going to be put? And so, for example, we, we did have the fairly recent example of Fife Council being asked um, by Scottish Government or directed by Scottish Government not to adopt a particular piece of um, SPG relating to developer contributions. Now, it was on the basis that um, that SPG hadn't gone through a, a full consultation process. <coughs> consultation, of course, is a separate issue, but the reason I mention that is that it was because of the degree of scrutiny that that SPG was subjected to in light of ELSIC that the issue of consultation came to the fore. And of course, developers and others were looking to be involved in a robust consultation process so that they could carry out that assessment to work out to their own satisfaction whether the sufficient connection test had been met. So you can see how putting all of those things together makes it ever more challenging for authorities to try to take these matters forward. So that really gives us a bit of background to where we are. Thinking then about the infrastructure levy um, and where, where it takes us to, big question mark, which is, isn't really a, a, good, a good sign. Um, so the idea of the levy um, is being explored by government as a means of trying to tackle at least some of these problems. And so if we think, well, what might it look like? How might it work? As, as Craig's really alluded to already, we don't have the answers to these questions at the moment. We don't even yet know if ultimately the levy is going to come forward. It's very much something which the government has been considering. You're probably aware that there's been a number of research projects um, which have been ongoing for the government trying to work out, is this the right way to go? So what they've basically done at the moment is to include um, within the bill some very broad enabling powers um, which essentially allows them to keep their options open insofar as the levy is concerned while further work um, is done and before a final decision is made really on which way they're going to go on it. So with that uh, caveat in place, let's now take a look at what the bill does say in, insofar as it says something. So, what types of development might potentially trigger the infrastructure levy? Well, the bill, let me tell you, has not narrowed this down in any way at the moment. So essentially what it's saying is that if regulations are under introduced in due course, that those would have the ability to relate to any development wholly or partly within their area. So it doesn't tell us a lot but I suppose what we can take from that is that this is not something which might just be considered in relation to housing development, or at least the government are at least keeping their options open that potentially if a levy is introduced, it could be introduced on a fairly wide basis. So, for example, Scottish Renewables are thinking about this very carefully at the moment because potentially wind farms could be contributing, could be economic development of all sorts that might contribute, 
not just the housing development where we might typically think of developer contributions coming forward. So that in itself is worthy of note. What type of projects then might be supported by a levy um, if, if one comes forward? Well, the bill um, provisions don't prescribe those types um, of infrastructure, but there is a very long list, and I see that I've left my, just grab this off the table just to give you a flavour of, so it's an inclusive list. So these things are the types of project which might then ultimately benefit from the levy. And it's very wide ranging from communications, transport, drainage, sewerage systems, flood defence systems, educational and medical facilities, um, facilities and other places for recreation. The point to take from that is essentially that it is very wide and includes certain sorts of um, projects which may be considered to fall out with the local authorities general remit. So you're probably aware of there being some controversy at the moment as to whether things like health centres, other medical facilities should be being the subject of Section 75s because is that something that really falls to local authorities? Should it be central government? Should that be viewed as, as being private um, in terms of the way that the health system currently works? But uh, as I say, the, the provisions are, are fairly <coughs> wide on that front at the moment. As to amounts, what, what might the hit be at the end of the day for um, developers? Well, unsurprisingly, regulations may provide for the amount um, of any levy, but uh, what the bill says is that regulations may simply state an amount. So, for example, you can imagine regulations containing some sort of schedule with different amounts for different sorts of developments and different areas, etc or they may simply set out a means for calculating that amount, so it might be some kind of formula-based system, which is then applied in individual cases. In terms of collection, administration, enforcement, all of that sort of onerous stuff, it does look as if that would be handled by local authorities, and your role may also extend to defending appeals in cases where um, developers are challenging the amount that they're being asked for. So particularly where we're working with some kind of formula or um, you know, amounts are contingent on different things which may be open to dispute. You can imagine these sorts of things ending up in front of reporters or other sorts of adjudicators. In a sense, I, su I suppose you can be faced with that sort of thing at the moment in terms of applications for modification or discharge of Section 75s, but it certainly could be a, a, a burden for, for you to take on in addition to everything else there. But after the point of collection of monies, um, regulations may also provide for the monies which are collected in to be transferred to the ministers to be spent by them on appropriate projects, and that's referred to as aggregation. Um, so potentially you can see that involving a bit of a loss of control in terms of the decisions on what's, ha what's happening, what are to be the project, priorities for projects being um, taken centrally rather than at the local level. And that may be a matter of some concern. So you can already see from that quick run through that a lot of issues would, unsurprisingly, still need to be bottomed out if indeed the levy is to go forward. But I think one of the trickiest areas here does relate to how the levy would interface with the practicalities of the planning system at the moment. So, as you know, currently we work on a minded to grant system when we think about um, Section 75s and developer contributions. So, um, planning permissions only go out the door once the agreements are signed up to. How would, how would things work under, under a levy system? Would it be the case that payments under the levy would have to be made in full and up front before planning permission is issued? <coughs> Certainly provides in the bill that um, regulations may provide for some kind of deferment of planning permission being issued. Um, but the idea of all payments having to be up front, I think, would be a concern. Obviously, currently, things tend to work on a staged payment process for chunky sums um, to enable, well, to help developers manage their cash flow and keep um, projects viable. So that's something that's going to need to be thought about quite carefully. I think perhaps um, just as importantly, perhaps more importantly, 
Is a levy just going to be too blunt an instrument to tackle situations where the infrastructure has yet to be built? And obviously that's the usual situation, but I'm comparing that to a situation where the, the project's already been delivered and you're kind of back backfilling, collecting in, in the monies after the fact. Um, and here what I'm really getting at, getting at is that under the current contribution system, again, a section 75 can prevent development starting until certain things um, have happened. It can phase development um, linked into certain contingent events, infrastructure being in place, payments being made. So will section 75s need to be retained in any event for that purpose? Or could that be handled by simply the use of suspensive conditions? And you have to imagine that you know that would require quite a bit by way of suspensive conditions to allow all of that to happen and potentially get you into quite tricky areas where suspensive conditions are in reality relating to the payment of money, which um, you know can be a difficult area and raises legal questions. Um, and moreover, if the planning and programming of the projects that are coming forward is actually being handled centrally, might planning authorities just have a lack of confidence that the projects are going to come forward at all at the point of having to take a decision on whether to be issuing a planning permission. So as you can see, these interface issues are really quite tricky and a, a lot has still to be worked out. Um, you know, before we go on to the issue that Craig mentioned about you know, the levy is, is likely only to kind of scratch the surface in terms of what we actually need to raise in terms of funds. So are we going to have a twin track um, would, would we need that twin track system in any event to be raising funds from, from different sources, so continuing with the existing system and bolting on the levy? So I think we can at least conclude from that that it's likely that planning obligations in Section 75s will be here to stay. Um, aside from the levy issues, the bill does have a few provisions relating to Section 75s, which we'll just mention briefly. In terms of the modification and discharge process under Section 75A, um, there are provisions which will allow planning authorities in the future to essentially amend Section 75A applications. And really what I mean by that is that at the moment all they can do is grant or refuse a Section 75A application. And if they might have been minded to grant it, had it been tweaked slightly, they're not really able to handle that. Going forward, they'll be able to have a discussion and essentially grant the application in terms somewhat different than those that were requested, which I think will be useful. There's also a technical change arising out of ELSIC, which is that um, Section 75 itself will be amended to allow Section 75s to deal with the payment of money only without also having to contain provisions um, relating to the regulation um, or use of the land. Wouldn't worry too much about that. It's really a technical change arising out of a small aspect of ELSIC, but it doesn't, it's, it doesn't tackle the big problem which has arisen out of ELSIC. Um, so it's really, a, you can regard it as a bit of a tidying up exercise. Just briefly, in terms of current trends, um, I think that Use of templates for Section 75s will continue. It's definitely a good thing. I also can imagine that, um, and I've been saying this for a long time, but I'll keep saying it, I think that use of unilateral undertakings will increase over time, particularly for simple cases. And we should remember, of course, that Section 75s do deal with other things as well as dealing with developer contributions. Um, so I, I think we will at some point see an upsurge in those. Um, we're likely to be left with some kind of twin tracking system, as I've, uh, as I've alluded to, with um, the if, if the levy does come forward. And finally, just on the issue of timing, um, whatever happens to Section 75s in the long run, it's clear that they will be here to stay at least for the foreseeable future. And Craig's given you the run through of the sort of legislative timetable. Regs coming through after all of that, you're going to be at least years hence uh, before we get to the bottom of what's happening with all of this. So I think the message there is don't throw out your styles just yet. I think you're going to need them for the foreseeable. Mm -hmm. And just to close off, I think it's you hopefully get the impression from um, this discussion and conclusion that we started off with, infrastructure is difficult, infrastructure delivery is difficult. These are the issues that the government has been grappling with and 
I think we're still far from the place of having easy, any easy answers coming forward. So um, it will be, I'm afraid, uh, as, as we always say at the end of these things, watch this space. Thanks very much, Karen and Craig. Um, got a few minutes for questions. Uh, maybe take two together if we have some. Yep, so we've got one there. Um, just wait for the microphone. Hi, um, out of all the, I appreciate it's very early stages yet, but um, out of all of the proposals that are in the bill, what do you think is the, is the one standout potential big win for local governments um, going forward, if you had to pick one? We've got another question, we'll take it at the same time. If you guys want to go to the podium just so the microphone can pick you up. Yeah. Okay. It's just really, um, I was going to ask, sorry, uh, I think Craig said in his presentation there's going to be no more supplementary planning guidance. Can I take it, is it the Elswick case that's a catalyst for that, that what was declared on uh, supplementary planning guidance was ruled unlawful? Okay, shall I okay. perhaps pick up on that yeah. one first? I don't believe that it was the catalyst. Um, obviously, it was a concern, supplementary planning guidance, but I think um, the, the proposal to get rid of the, the SPG has, has perhaps been more to do with the feeling that um, there's a need to sort of streamline the number of documents that everyone is working with and that following the introduction of the statutory SPG, we're getting absolutely overloaded with and if you share the view, um, Craig, of just different publications which were becoming very unwieldy and sort of not user friendly for, well, professionals and remind members of the public to navigate around. My own personal view is that um, with SPG, statutory SPG going, I think you were sort of alluding to this as well, Craig, something will have to come in its place. I suspect we're heading back to the situation that we had before where you'll simply have non statutory um, planning guidance, whatever it's actually called. Um, whether it will be, you know, P PG or something else that people will, um, some new tag that they will stick on it. So it may then have a different, uh, it, will still, it will still be a material consideration in the planning process and it may well be that developer contributions will still be dealt with under that banner and, you know, won't really make a difference to the ELSIC issues. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I don't think ELSIC, ELSIC was the, the driver. I think Scottish Government have been really keen to, Make plans and planning and planning documentation much more succinct um, and much more strategic, and I think, as Karen says, the the C uh, supplementary guidance is uh, is just adding too much detail to things. I, I do worry about it. I think there are some things which do need some of that uh, some of that um, that guidance, um, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure if that circle can be squared just now. I think Karen's probably right. It's going to be through informal guidance and and, and, and with the way forward for things. As to how that plays out in the longer term, I'm not quite sure. And any wins for local government in the bill? Yeah, in terms of the big wins, a good question. Um, and, well, it's maybe one for, for the room, but I'm not sure that, um, yeah, whether, whether the planning authorities will sort of really view themselves as huge winners at the end of all of this process. I think that in itself is a good question. But I think there was general support for, from certainly from the planning authorities, for the move from the five to the ten years on the LDPs, because that is very much aimed at freeing up officers' time and allowing perhaps a distribution of staff from one place to another to focus on that delivery and to allow them to sort of uh, allow offers to be free, freed up from from that kind of constant cycle of plan making, as as Craig um, as Craig uh, touched on earlier. However, that unfortunately I think will be counterbalanced by the introduction of the local place plan so it's kind of I feel it is a bit of a giving with one hand and taking away you know with the other yeah. which is is unfortunate yeah I'm not going to give you one big win but I think that the big issue for me is resources um and I was quite um I wasn't quite happy with some of the way in which Scottish government have perhaps articulated some of their thinking on this as Karen said the idea behind the 10-year um, the development plan was essentially to use three or four years to, or hopefully two and a half to three years, to actually publish the development plan and that, that would free up resources to deliver it. Um, in the committee debates, um, the minister um, thought that that would actually free up uh, resources to do stuff such as local police plans, as, um, as Karen said. But 
that's talking about staff resource, and there's still an issue in terms of a financial resource in there which hasn't been addressed. So, so for me, the big issue is how this, if this is going to be a cost-neutral bill. Um, the financial memorandum accompanying the bill sort of tries to say that. I'm not convinced it is. I think, again, because of a lack of detail, we don't know all the processes and procedures which we'll have to go through, and that'll only come out through regulation. So we need to keep a watching brief on that, absolutely. What one, one sort of win on that sort of resourcing front is, is the provision to, for, for charging for different things. Um, I think that has to be handled carefully, um, but I think there's, there's some scope there for some things. Um, but it's not quite been the, um, uh, the sort of bonfire of the processes and procedures and, um, that we, we maybe anticipated. There'll be some freeing up of property development rights. Not sure how much that will actually, uh, what impact that will actually have. Um, but it's for watching, uh, certainly that. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's important, this resourcing thing, and I don't think we've got a clear, totally clear idea as to what the implications are as yet. Okay, thanks very much both. Um, sorry, we're going to have to wrap up for uh, our coffee break just now, um, but I'm sure Karen and Craig will be able to take their questions uh, during that. Um, just one little piece of housekeeping before we go, in case anybody is wondering what the little blue and green postcard is, you'll all be dealing with GDPR. We're, de we're dealing with that too. This is just a way of us confirming that you would still like to hear from us about things like today. Hopefully nobody's sitting there thinking, I never want to hear from you people again. Uh, <laughs> in which case, uh, please do just pop your name and email address on that and either leave it on your chair or hand it to one of us. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll break for coffee now uh, and we will reconvene at half past 11. Um, in the meantime, please join me in thanking Karen and Craig. So coffee is just outside. Yeah. Some issues I haven't thought about.
Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, still just uh, bringing in a few stragglers, but I uh, want to keep us to time um, as much as we can. So um, without further ado, uh, we're going to kick off our third session, um, which is on uh, energy service companies and is going to be delivered by Sarah Jane MacArthur, who's a partner in Brodie's energy and infrastructure team. Uh, and Sarah Jane has particular expertise in relation to uh, ESCOs and combined heat and power. So over to you. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, and what are we at? Good is it still good morning? Yep, good morning, everybody. So a brief outline of what I'm proposing to cover today. Um, I have put quite a lot in here to cover in the time available, but don't worry if your latest burning issue isn't here, then there should be time for some questions at the end. And I'll also apologise in advance, there are quite a lot of words on my slides. Um, the aim there was hopefully to give you something that you could uh, take away and refer back to. I tried to put some pictures in just to liven up a little bit as well. Um, so we'll look at what is an ESCO, we'll consider whether you need or want to have an ESCO, I'll look at the powers of local authorities to do energy projects more generally and to set up ESCOs, and I'll look at quite quickly through some additional points and lessons learned from things that we've been doing with ESCOs more recently. And finally, as you've already been talking about new duties this morning, I'll look briefly at the new duty that's coming in terms of local heat and energy efficiency strategies. So, what is an ESCO? We lawyers always like to start with our defined terms, but it's really important here because the terms used quite a lot and in a wide range of circumstances without people really knowing the context of what, what an ESCO is or what it's doing in any particular case. So, I did a quick Google search because that's usually everyone's first port of call, and I think the first three answers you get are that ESCO is a manufacturer of engineering components, a publishing services company, and the classification of European skills, competencies, qualifications and occupations, which doesn't even spell ESCO. So not much help there. Um, it means many different things to many different projects, but broadly it stands for energy services company. But does that actually help you? Um, in commercial terms, because that's where energy services companies are most frequently used, it's an umbrella term for a lot of different activities. It usually involves the provision and management of an energy solution for a particular site, or a particular area, or for a particular business across a range of sites. So, for example, ASDA might employ an ESCO to deliver an energy solution for their entire business, or a commercial developer might be looking at setting up an ESCO or employing an ESCO to provide energy services for a particular development. <coughs> ESCOs often provide a mix of energy generation and supply services, and they may also involve the introduction of energy efficiency measures, or more recently, something called capacity trading, and in that respect, I'm referring to people having on-site generation, so having solar panels or CHP on their site and having some spare energy to sell to other people. Or more recently, uh, people being paid not to use electricity for a period of time. So you have large retailers who maybe shut off their fridges for a couple of minutes or 30 seconds at a time and get paid to do that. Um, so the energy services company has been a label for the businesses that provide these energy services and also for individual project companies who are providing energy projects. And it can also include energy performance contracting, which some of you might have heard of, which is a way that you can get energy efficiency measures adopted with guaranteed savings being given. So the point is that ESCOs are not just for the public sector. Um, they've been operating across the private sector um, for years and covered a wide range of activities. So what do we mean for ESCOs in the public sector? Generally, they've set settled into two key categories, which I'm going to call project companies and strategic companies. The project companies, it's really like an, a special purpose company that you might establish to do a PPP project. It's established to deliver a particular energy project to a defined set of customers and to own the necessary infrastructure, rights and contracts for that project. An example of that would be Aberdeen, set up Aberdeen Heat and Power to deliver its first um, heating project. Although, of course, Aberdeen Heat and Power has expanded and developed to deliver a lot more projects than um, those initial ones. Alternatively, you could, try, you could set up a strategic ESCO. Um, that would be established for, to deliver a strategic aim, such as providing energy efficiency advice or delivering a range of fuel poverty measures or coordinating the delivery of a number of different energy projects. An example of that would be Energy for Edinburgh that was set up relatively recently. And 
One of Energy for Edinburgh's stated functions is to identify and deliver projects in the Council's Sustainable Energy Action Plan. So you can see that's a much wider remit for that company. The key is that using the word ESCO doesn't automatically determine a structure or a fixed idea. So there's a high degree of flexibility, but also a need for you to define what ESCO means for your local authority or your particular project. Um, and I've put up the end there, sometimes we use ESCO quite loosely to refer to local authority owned energy companies like Robin Hood Energy, which is, I think, something quite different to what uh, we've been using ESCOs for in Scotland so far. Okay, so now we know roughly what an ESCO is. Uh, do we actually need to use an ESCO? Um, and I particularly chose that image because that's what your wall should look like when you've run a proper workshop to work out whether or not you need an ESCO. Um, and you've explored fully all of the risks and benefits. So what we don't want is the tail wagging the dog. We don't want an ESCO just for the sake of it. ESCOs are rarely a requirement, except in some specific cases, which I'll get onto at the end. And it's important that establishing the ESCO is not the end in itself, but it's a means to deliver that end. You need a clear rationale for deciding whether or not to establish an ESCO. And the anticipated benefits of doing so have to outweigh the risks and the time and expense of actually setting one up. And there should always be a sound business case, as you would expect for a, an initiative such as this. So how do you establish that business case? Well, firstly, I would be considering at least the, the first few factors listed there and considering whether each of them can only be addressed by using an ESCO or are most likely to be addressed by using an ESCO. So first and foremost, project objectives. It's so important to identify right at the outset what the objectives are for the project, why are you doing this, um, and then to go back later and test against those project objectives and make sure that you're still going to, uh, that you're still doing the right thing to achieve them. And the consideration here is whether an ESCO will better help you achieve those project objectives. It's also important to identify the project constraints, technical, legal, financial, and again, consider whether an ESCO will help you address some of those constraints or whether they might in fact intensify some of those constraints by um, separating out the ESCO from, from powers that the local authority has. It's important to assess each individual local authority's risk appetite for doing these projects and consider whether an ESCO might help by taking some of that delivery risk slightly one step removed from the authority, or whether in fact the creation of the ESCO and the governance that comes along with that is actually just too much of a risk in the first place. So there's, there's two sides to that as well. You need to consider what, how you're gonna finance and fund your ESCO and your energy project, and again, consider whether the ESCO enables you to attract more finance because it allows you to more easily get private sector finance in, or does it actually cut off access to some funding routes that you'd be planning to use through your own local authority sources? Capacity and capability to deliver could be enhanced by using an ESCO because you can bring in more expertise to the ESCO business, but equally capacity and capability to actually manage and run the ESCO needs to be considered as well. Um, and in terms of the private sector investment options, if you're planning to go down a joint venture route, then an ESCO might be beneficial because you can then have a, um, a way for each party to own shares or own a proportion of the ESCO. But it's not, again, it's not essential. You can do that contractually as well. The key message here is that there needs to be quite a lot of time investment in the early stages of the project to understand whether an ESCO is required or desirable and make sure that you've spent time identifying the elements and then driving the delivery model rather than setting out from the start saying we want to do an ESCO, how do we justify it? Um, I did say that I would mention briefly a couple of the areas where you might need an ESCO. If you're trying to establish a tech house structure, now I'm not the procurement expert, so procurement questions to Charles in the front row, please. Um, if you want to establish a tech house structure, then each of the public sector participants in that structure would need to have control over the vehicle. So it would probably be easiest to set up an ESCO to achieve that. Um, and equally, if you want to use project finance, the lenders will usually require that you've established a vehicle to separately package up the project. Um, you might also need an ESCO for charitable uh, status reasons, but I don't think that's going to be an issue for local authorities. 
So this slide should probably actually be called the Do I Nevertheless Want an ESCO because I probably don't actually need one. Um, well, there are lots of benefits of having one. Um, I've listed some up here, but you know, the, the, the ESCO gives you an ability to obtain necessary skills which might not be inherently within your own organisation. Um, and importantly, independence has been a reason cited for using an ESCO, and I know that it was one of the um, important reasons for Aberdeen setting up theirs. The, the ESCO can start to make the best decisions for the heat business without necessarily being tied to changing council priorities or politics. There's scope for some risk transferred in terms of the delivery of the project, so you're getting some of that risk away from the core business while retaining a high degree of influence and control over the vehicle. Um, and importantly, if you're thinking about the long-term goals of, of any energy project, what are you planning to do with it? Do you want to sell it onto the private sector? Do you want to hold it within the council for a long period of time? If you think you might be scoped to sell it on or to seek private sector investment in the future, then an ESCO is a really useful way to package it up for that. There are, however, risks of doing so. There's a, there's a cost to set up and administer the ESCO and to manage it. Um, and just because you've set up an ESCO doesn't mean you can just kind of leave it. It, it needs some support from a council, especially in the early stages you've effectively created a start-up business. It's going to need staff, it's going to need resources, it's going to need facilities um, until it can raise its own finance and generate revenue. You do create a little bit of procurement risk by setting up the ESCO if you then need to buy services back from the ESCO, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail later. And while independence is a good thing, independence can also lead to divergence from what the council will want to achieve. So that governance and management of the ESCO is really important, and I'll cover that in a bit more detail later as well. So if you've decided you're going to do an energy project and you're going to use an ESCO, we'll move on to the powers to do that. And apologies, there are a few packed slides in here. So the primary power for local authorities to do energy projects is in section 170A of Local Government Scotland Act 1973. So that confers the discretionary function on the local authority to produce and supply heat and electricity. There is a lot more flexibility in that power with respect to heat rather than electricity. So in terms of heat, councils can produce heat, they can buy it, sell it, supply it onto premises in their local premises in their local area or without their local area. Um, so there's there's maximum flexibility in relation to heat. There's then also a, 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 a bank of additional powers in section 170A and 170B um, for dealing with putting heat infrastructure, so pipes in the ground and dealing with metering and access to read meters. Those are not present for electricity and the powers around electricity are quite a bit more constrained. So councils can only supply electricity if they have generated it from waste, if they've generated it alongside heat, or if they've generated it from a particular specified list of renewable sources, although that list is relatively uh, long. It's important to note that electricity is subject to regulation under the Electricity Act 1989, and these uh, local government powers <coughs> don't override the Electricity Act. Um, the kind of health warning that comes along here is if you have a project which includes the generation, distribution or supply of electricity, doing those things without a licence or without a licence exemption is a criminal offence. So please can we make sure that if you're doing that, that we correctly either applied for a licence or made sure that it falls within the licence exemptions that are available. And there are plenty of licence exemptions available, particularly for the types of decentralised energy projects that you'll probably be looking at, but they're quite complicated and you need to make sure that you've ticked all the boxes. Um, section 170 A and B confer discretionary powers, so there's no need to link them to other functions, although in practice they probably will be linked to some other functions in terms of your Climate Change Act duties and maybe even some education or housing duties that you have as well. We also then need to consider Section 69 of the Local Government Act 1973, and as you'll know, that's the ancillary power to do things to facilitate or that are conducive or incidental to the discharge of functions. So because um, Section 170A is your discretionary function, you can then use Section 69 to do things which are ancillary to that, including setting up the ESCO. Um, 
It can also, in theory, be used for the ancillary electricity infrastructure. You might need to plug the gap in uh, Section 170 in relation to electricity infrastructure, but again, just make sure that it's not being used to override the, the licensing structure that sits within the, the Electricity Act. Um, obviously, Section 69 does require a primary function, so the, the easiest one to use would be Section 170A, but you could also refer back to your Climate Change Act duties as well. We don't have free reign to do everything with those powers. There are some constraints to consider, um, particularly if you're looking at one of those strategic ESCOs that's going to do some business planning activities. The, there is a piece that needs to be done before you've outsourced that business planning activity to the ESCO because you need to, they need to be doing that in fulfilment of a strategy which the local authority has already um, thought about, considered, um, including its aims and objectives. And, and put some parameters around before you, you outsource it completely to an ESCO. If you hand over too much strategy development to the ESCO without having considered what the strategy would be and the controls around it, then you risk um, creating governance issues, but also um, resulting in a potentially challengeable delegation of functions, which opens you to uh, judicial review risk. So again, coming back to that governance piece around what you're asking the ESCO to do. Power to borrow, very important for ESCOs where you're looking to fund particular projects. Um, obviously, that's Schedule 3 of the Local Government Act 1975, and there are plenty of powers to borrow in there, but they're not completely unconstrained. Even if you're carrying out the project yourself, there will be caps on the amount of um, borrowing for capital expenditure, but it becomes a bit more problematic when you're also thinking about potentially borrowing to fund an ESCO and an ESCO's expenditure. Um, and that also might present issues in terms of complying with internal treasury management. <clears throat> there shouldn't be any problem with giving upfront grants or loans if you have the resources to do that, but again, just be considerate if you're um, borrowing in to do that, that might be a problem. And if you're going to be a customer of your ESCO, if it's going to be providing services or energy, then you do also need to be in mind the best value duty to make sure that the ESCO will deliver the best value solution to your business as usual alternative. Finally, in terms of constraints, I wanted to cover commercial trading. Um, where you are setting up an ESCO and it's going to sell heat and, and or electricity to third parties, that will almost certainly be commercial trading, particularly if those third, third parties are um, businesses or even domestic users who are not your own social housing tenants. There is power within the Local Authorities Goods and Services Act 1970 to trade, but that's subject to a limit set by the Scottish Ministers. And as the Scottish Ministers have not in fact set a limit, that limit is, is in fact zero. Um, it takes you quite a lot of reading of that section to get there, but that's where you end up. Um, so Scottish Ministers' consent is required for um, the commercial trading activity um, and Scottish Ministers are now aware that their consent is required for uh, commercial trading in these scenarios. You can potentially get around it by establishing a not-for-profit ESCO. So if you didn't set up an ESCO to deliver a project and you said that was not-for-profit, then there would be no sort of commercial revenue coming back to the council. We think that's a potential way around it, but obviously if you actually want to get the revenue back from the ESCO, then that doesn't really work. So I said I would run through some additional points and lessons learned that we've had uh, from working on ESCOs relatively recently on, on recent projects. Now, there are a few things in here that I am not the expert on again, <laughs> but I think it, they're relevant in terms of what we've been looking at recently. State aid. Um, state aid has to be considered on each of these um, projects where we're looking at, particularly where we're looking at commercial schemes. So consider who your ESCO is going to be serving. You know, is, it just, is it just providing services back to the council, social housing tenants, or is it actually working like a business and uh, working like an energy supplier? Um, if it's the latter, it's almost certainly caught by state aid because it's performing like an undertaking. Um, there are helpful exemptions under the general block exemption regulation. Article 46 deals with energy efficient heating and cooling, but in that uh, block exemption there are in aid intensity levels which you can't breach. It's, it's roughly 50%, um, which can go up or down depending on where the project's located and which entity is actually going to get the, uh, the aid. Um, so it's really important 
if you're going to get grant funding into your project. So, for example, if your project is, has secured uh, LCITP funding from the Scottish Government, those programmes are often already sized to meet the aid intensity levels. So then any additional funding that you want to put into the project has to be commercial. So it either has to come from uh, private sector or it has to be commercial under the market economy investor principle. So it has to be on commercial terms. And that might have an impact for the, the overall returns from the project. So you need to bear that in mind at the outset. I said I would cover a little bit more on procurement. Um, so it's kind of stating the obvious, if your ESCO is 100% owned by the public sector, then the procurement rules are going to apply to it. However, ESCOs, helpfully, can also be utilities because if they are going to own or operate an energy network, then for some of the procurement they're doing, they could be caught by the utilities procurement regs. Um, and there's also a helpful procurement exemption in there under the utility rules for bulk purchase of energy onto a network. So if you're going to set up, a, a, say, a heat network to buy heat from your local energy from waste plant, that heat purchase doesn't need a procurement process, so it's one you can tick off the list. Um, obviously, the usual design, build, operation, maintenance of any energy project that the ESCO delivers or the provision of uh, services that it requires will need a competitive procurement. You can obviously consider the uh, use of appropriate frameworks. I underline the word appropriate there because you need to make sure that the framework you're using actually the people on it can deliver the energy services and the particular skills that you're looking for, and perhaps set one up if you're going to be doing lots of projects or set one up jointly with your neighbouring authorities. Um, the last bullet here, where the local authority is also going to be a customer of the ESCO. Um, if you as a local authority do an energy project such that you have generated some energy which you're then going to use, there's no procurement issue because you're effectively self-supplying. However, if you then establish an ESCO which generates some energy and then wants to sell that energy back to you, you may have created a procurement risk. The, the, the council may actually need to procure that energy back. The only way around that really is to set up is to make sure that the ESCO complies with the Controlled Persons Administrative... As, I can't even say it. <laughs> controlled Persons Administrative Arrangement, and that's where the Council's exercising control over the ESCO in the way that it does over its other departments, that the supplies being made by the, es the, the ESCO to the Council is at least 80%. So if you're setting up an ESCO to do lots of other commercial supplies, that's not going to work. And also there can be no private sector investment in that ESCO. So if you're setting up a joint venture ESCO, then you, you have got procurement risk. We can, we're sure there are ways to mitigate and manage that procurement risk, but it's just to be aware that it's there if you set up the ESCO. Okay, I've mentioned governance quite a bit. Um, ESCOs are alios, and there's been quite a lot in terms of the governance of values and how we get that right uh, from Audit Scotland and others. And I think the message here is that there has to be quite a lot of work done at the outset to make sure that the ESCO you're going to set up is properly going to be properly governed and managed. Um, the factors that you need to be taking into account are what, what's the ESCO being established to, what's its objectives and how far can it then deviate from those objectives in the future. And that business planning process, if it's going to implement its objectives, how much control does the local authority need over that? How's the ESCO going to be managed? If you're setting up a company, who are going to be the directors? Will they all be councillors? Will you bring in private sector individuals to bring additional expertise? Who will have the deciding say in any decisions that are making? In any, any decisions that are made? There need to be policies and procedures for managing and monitoring, but also consider whether there are policies and procedures that the local authority would want its ESCO to be complying with um, and how easily it has to transfer those on to what is effectively a start-up business. But fundamentally, it's about regulating the relationship between the ESCO and its parent public body. Don't underestimate how long that's going to take and how many internal stakeholders are going to need to participate in that conversation and in the approval process. Um, I think people have thought it's much more straightforward than it is once you start getting all the various departments involved. If you're going to set up an ESCO, an ESCO can be any sort of... You don't say the word ESCO and then you've immediately said, ah, oh, that's going to be a company or a partnership. The ESCO can be whatever type of entity you want. So there's a piece of work to be done to establish what type of entity your ESCO should be. 
Um, broadly speaking, the first three are likely to be the most appropriate, so some kind of company or a limited liability partnership, although the others do have their place in specific circumstances. Um, the factors to consider in terms of your choice of entity are um, flexibility. Some firms are just more flexible than others um, in terms of their constitution and um, their ability to distribute profit, that kind of thing. So it just depends if flexibility is something that you need. Um, liability, and by that I mean limited liability. If you set up a company, the shareholders have limited liability, so, so too with a limited liability partnership, but not so with all structures. Um, you need to consider the tax position of the entity as well. Whether you need it to, whether you, it's preferable for it to be taxed or the owners of it to be taxed, um, consider whether it's going to make a profit or not. Some structures will then be set up purely for not-for-profit and preclude you making a profit from it. Um, we've looked at charitable status for ESCOs a couple of times. We think it's possible to set up charitable pur uh, for charitable purposes. Um, to be given to an ESCO, but sometimes the level of private benefit can make it difficult to actually establish them as charities. So in order to do, um, in order to achieve that charitable status, you might need a two-tier structure with a charitable top cone and a trading sub, which is just an extra layer of complexity. If it's something that you're particularly interested in, then obviously we could look at it, but so far we haven't set any up as charities. Um, and finally, just funding and finance, bear in mind that that might dictate a particular type of entity. And finally, on this section, I know it's obvious, we've got ducks in a row at the bottom there, but um, if you are setting up an ESCO, please remember that it is a distinct entity and any project rights that were held by the local authority will have to be transferred in there. So thinking about things like the pipes and the roads, the, the, the ESCO is not the authority. Um, also, I've mentioned EFW plants, PPP buildings and other alleys and things like leisure centres owned by trusts. The interface, how the ESCO is going to interface with those other organisations which aren't really the authority um, has to be managed. Don't automatically assume that the ESCO is going to be able to achieve the same levels of interface that the local authority could. Right. I'm probably running slightly over, so I've got five minutes on the new duties which are coming in terms of local heat and energy efficiency strategies. Um, this is a new duty on local authorities that's going to be introduced and the duty will be to produce a local heat and energy efficiency strategy. Sorry, it's such a mouthful, so from now on they're LHEs. Um, and that's to be aimed at improving the energy efficiency and decarbonising the heat supply of the local area under SEEP, SEEP being Scotland's energy efficiency programme. The LHEs will cover a 15 to 20 year period, so a really long term piece of work, and they'll be subject to ongoing reporting obligations back to Scottish ministers. It might be possible to discharge these duties jointly, so you could team up with other local authorities if there's a particular measure that makes sense to do across a region rather than um, just in a particular local area. It's peppered throughout the consultation, so engagement with communities is going to be absolutely essential as part of this, um, this strategy work. And it's really important to link it into the planning process as well. So if you're doing a local development plan, you need to make sure that's joined up with the local heat and energy efficiency strategy. So you're not doing a massive development there, but an energy project over here, that kind of thing. I'm not going to get into this in any detail. There's just a, a detailed process for how you can do, how you're going to do a local heat and energy efficiency strategy. And it, it does look like it's going to be quite a lot of work. Um, but essentially it's about assessing the building stock and the energy solutions currently available in the local authority area, setting a target as to how you're going to demand, uh, reduce demand and improve, um, reduce demand and decarbonise, and then set in place a properly prioritised programme to actually deliver against those targets. We're now in the, uh, the second consultation for that completed in February this year. There, it's linked into the government's energy strategy and energy efficiency is also a national infrastructure priority. So we have seen those consultations be fast-tracked. I'm expecting that there will be a fast-track in terms of implementing this duty. There are pilots underway at the moment. Um, we had an interim report on those in March, but it was based on pre-pilot data, so it wasn't particularly useful in terms of understanding how they're going. Um, so the implementation timeline is awaited, but I think that once the pilots are completed, there will be work having done in the background to make sure that once those pilots are completed, this duty comes in and people start having to work on these quite quickly. 
that's me. I'm now happy to take any questions. Great. Thanks, Sarah Jane. Um, we've got the roving mic again, so we have questions. Yep. Um, just wait for the mic. There you go. Just uh, about the, the strategy for decarbonising the, the, the heat within like an area, is that actually within the gift or is it within the control of a local authority? Because as far as I can see, it's not really. Um, it, it, seems diff it seems quite difficult to put a duty on a, on a council which you've no power to actually, you know, to, to carry it out. So the power... The, mm, okay, the, the duty will be to develop the strategy and it's... I think the main intention behind it is to set out a delivery programme which private sector can see and then come along and say, OK, well, we understand that the, any developments there should consider a district heating, for example, or that there's a massive energy efficiency retrofit needed to these buildings here so they can then come in and fill that gap. But I do anticipate that look, some local authorities will want to... Um, deliver some of those programmes themselves. And they will, they will certainly have capability to deliver aspects of it, if not every single bit of it. Yep, I'll be back. Hi, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, just to summarise, this is an area that's new to me, but in terms of the 1970 Act, local authorities have the power to deliver heat and electricity without setting up an ESCO. Yes. And it does appear that for a small scale scheme, it, it does seem, an ESCO seems a bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut. From, from what you've said, yeah. all the, um, I think from our point of view um, in my local authority, we're looking at a smaller scheme. And the risk element, separating that out from the local authority is attractive. Mm -hmm. But all of the other aspects that come with it seem a bit overly onerous for what we're trying to achieve. So we've been doing, just through LCITP and the, the, um, the, the funding streams that have come out after that as well, I think we've done about 12 or 13 business cases over the last 12 months uh, for a range of different public sector bodies, so not just local authorities. Um, and it's been quite clear that for smaller projects, most people have opted not to have an ESCO because it's just made sense. So, for example, the housing associations, they're like, well, you know, we're just doing, we're just putting heating into buildings that we own anyway. We don't really need an ESCO to do that. And we've agreed and said that's, yeah, there's no point in doing that. Where you're setting up, where this is like the first of many projects, for example, an ESCO might be useful because you're then absorbing the cost of that on the first project. And then you've got a ready-made vehicle that can go and deliver many more, which I guess is the perhaps the, the Aberdeen experience. Um, or where you, where you have a strategic aim of doing lots more with the ESCO, there, there may be a value in setting it up. Um, one project that we looked at recently, um, the local authority were really keen to have the community take over the project in the future. So it would seem appropriate then to set up an ESCO so that you had the vehicle there and it would be much easier to transfer it over in the future. But that was a you know, there was a particular case for that. Anything else? Excellent. No, nope. <laughs> I've by bombarded your you with too much. <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, uh, we'll get our next panel up. Um, and in the meantime, if everybody could just thank Sarah Jane in the usual manner. Thank you very much. So, um, our final session uh, for the morning. Yep, so is, uh, is the year in review, uh, so a case roundup, um, and uh, this is going to be delivered by Neil McLean, um, who is a managing associate, um, promoted to managing associate as of yesterday in the, uh, government <laughs> in the government regulation and competition team, uh, and also at Douglas Waddle, who's a senior solicitor in the GRC team. Um, and Neil and Douglas both have significant experience acting for local and other uh, public authorities uh, in judicial reviews, appeals and other litigation. So over to you, Neil. So, so our session is entitled A Year in Review, A Case Law Roundup. Now, we're mindful that as local authorities, there's an overwhelming amount of case law that affects the work that you do. 
And we know that because we get weekly updates from our library, which summarises those cases. Um, and we're happy to share those with you as well. So one of the things that we have been doing recently is giving local authority clients access to our regular bulletins. So if you are interested in seeing all of the cases that affect you, then speak to, to Jackie or me at the end. Um, we only have 45 minutes, so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on five cases that we think were interesting in the last year, um, so the last 12 months. We're focusing on Scottish cases only. Um, but we're very conscious that this is the last session in a morning with a lot of content which you've had to absorb. So what we wanted to try and make it a bit more interesting for you. And one of the things we always like to do when we're doing a case law update is to identify a theme. So Douglas and I sat down to plan this session at the time that the news was breaking that ABBA were about to reform <laughs> and that they were going to produce new material. So we decided that we would make... ABBA our theme uh, and believe it or not in a Brodie's first we're going to attempt to find a link to ABBA in cases involving licensing, access rights, planning and legal aid. Um, I want to assure those watching the live stream that Douglas and I are actually here um, and that there are no plans to currently send avatars of us out on tour but that's something that we can certainly look into um, for next year. So I'm going to hand over to Douglas, who's going to take the first um, two of our cases, uh, and I'll be back um, to speak about the final two of our greatest hits from the last year. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I hope you approve of what I'm about to say then. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, thank you very much, Neil. Um, so the first case I'm going to talk to you about is a licensing case which was an appeal to the sheriff and was NATL amusement against North Lanarkshire Licensing Board. And what this case is about is that it was an application by a Coatbridge cinema complex operator to vary the terms of their premises license to sell alcohol within the cinema complex. Now, the original license was granted with the condition that provided there was to be no alcohol consumption in any screening area unless the film shown was classified for those of 18 years plus or for private or corporate events. So if you wanted to go and see Mamma Mia, um, you wouldn't be allowed to consume alcohol during the screening. Um, the, uh, the cinema operators put in an application to vary the premises license and allow customers to take and consume alcohol in any screening area after 7 p.m. Um, before 7 p.m., alcohol would only be permitted in screening areas that were showing films classified for 18-year-olds and above or private or corporate events. Um, so what happened in this case was that the board refused the application and they did this for two reasons. The first was that Granting the licence was inconsistent with the statutory licensing objective under the Licensing Scotland Act 2005 of protecting children and young people. And what the board said was that they were uncomfortable with alcohol being consumed in screening areas where young people were present and they thought that adequate supervision of the consumption of alcohol in these areas would not be able to take place given that these are naturally darkened areas. And the board thought that their concerns were real and not based on fanciful or speculative considerations. And the second reason that the board gave was that the premises were unsuitable for the sale of alcohol under the proposed variation, having regard to the location, character and condition of the premises. And what the board said here was that the dark and screening areas were not a suitable environment for alcohol to be consumed when young persons were watching films. Um, it's also worth noting that the police, the Police Scotland made some representations to the board opposing the variation of the premises licence um, and they had concerns about disorder and the risk of harm to young people. There we go. So uh, the board's decision was appealed by the cinema operators on the basis that the board had exercised their discretion unreasonably. And what the operator said was that they had reached a decision for which there was no proper or adequate factual basis. 
And in short, the uh, sheriff essentially agreed with that. In his judgment, what the sheriff said was that while the board had made clear that it was uncomfortable about the potential for young people to access alcohol, it needed to go beyond that to provide adequate reasons for its decision making. And what the sheriff said was that if the board was grounding its decision upon those concerns, it needed clarity as to what constituted the basis for these concerns, such as instances of harm that had resulted elsewhere from similar policies or any particular justification for treating the locality in question differently from other areas. And what the sheriff said there was that he could not detect any such justification for the board's concerns in its decision. And as a result, the sheriff considered that the reasons provided by the board were inadequate and that the board exercised their discretion in an unreasonable fashion. And as a result, he quashed the board's decision and proceeded simply to grant the application rather than remitting it back. Um, and this case just serves as a reminder that local authorities, including licensing boards, need to provide adequate reasons for any decision that they take and also demonstrate a factual basis for their action if relevant. So a failure to provide reasons or to demonstrate a factual basis for the decision will be treated as an improper or may be treated as an improper exercise of discretion and quashed. And uh, this is particularly important for licensing boards who um, can take decisions sometimes in a fluid manner and it's the uh, responsibility of solicitors and clerks to the board to advise that the board uh, ensures that they give proper decisions for doing so. However, of course, this can sometimes really be quite difficult uh, given the manner in which boards take decisions and, of course, it may well be that a board is simply fixated on taking a particular course of action. Um, so it seems to go full circle that if you do want to watch Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again after 7pm in a certain Coatbridge cinema this summer, you can do so with alcoholic refreshment. But if you are a teenager on those premises, you may well be asked, does your mother know that you're out? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably about as good as it's going to get from me. <laughs> yes, so the next case is now about land access rights. And this case is an inner house decision on the right to roam under the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. Um, and the facts in this case, they do appear to be disputed and they are a bit complex. But basically, the landowner is a company based in Liechtenstein and owns a large estate in the Trossachs. Um, part of that estate, which was around 300 acres um, and included open hillside fields, woodlands, a farmhouse and outbuildings, was enclosed by fences with two locked gates, meaning that the public did not have access to that land. Um, the gates had been erected and were generally locked prior to the Land Reform Act coming into force. And one of the reasons for the gates being locked was that there was a wild boar enclosure within the uh, enclosed area, and there were also deer and cattle. Although by the time that this case came to court, the wild boars had gone. And there was a sign still there, even after the wild boars had gone, saying, danger, wild boar. Um, so I, I rather struggled to get an ABBA reference in here. But what you might say is that, unlike ABBA, the landowners here did not want to give access to their tropical love land. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that ABBA didn't really write anything about access rights or the Land Reform Act. <laughs> So uh, the Park Authority then proceeded to issue a notice stating that the landowner had contravened the public access provisions of the Land Reform Act by erecting the wild boar sign and locking the two gates. And the notice required the landowner to remove the sign and unlock the gates. This notice was appealed by the landowner to the sheriff. There we go. So there were really two points to the appeal. And the first uh, was about section 14 of the Land Reform Act, which prohibits landowners from taking certain actions 
with the purpose or main purpose of preventing or deterring the use of access rights. And these might include erecting fences, locking gates, putting up signs, amongst other things. And the second point was that the gates had been erected and locked prior to the Land Reform Act coming into force and therefore the land was not covered by the public access provisions of the Act. So the Sheriff allowed the appeal on the basis that as the gates had been in place and locked before that Act came into force, the access rights were not applicable to the land. Um, and he also allowed the appeal on the basis that the purpose of the landowner locking the gates was to manage the land responsibility due to the presence of potentially dangerous animals within the enclosure. And his purpose was not to prevent or to deter responsible access. So the case was then appealed to the Sheriff Appeal Court, which decided that the concerns expressed by the landowner were so broad as really being about access rights in general. And they therefore held that the landowner's purpose had been to prevent the exercise of access rights and therefore they upheld the appeal by the park authority. And the case was then appealed to the inner house. So on appeal to the inner house, uh, the inner house took a different view of what the test under section 14 is. So it decided that the test about the landowner's purpose or main purpose was not a subjective test. That is, it was not about what the landowner's intention was in putting up the gates. The inner house decided that the test was in fact an objective test. That is, whether the landowner's actions had the effect of preventing the exercise of uh, access rights over land which weren't excluded from that regime. And the effect was, in this case, that the authorities' notice was upheld. So uh, the inner house also decided that although the land had been enclosed and the gates erected and locked prior to the Land Reform Act coming to force, um, the land was still subject to access rights and a failure to take remedial action, i.e. unlocking gates, would be in breach of that act. Um, so the effect of the decision on whether the landowner's intention or effect actually means now that it is harder for landowners to restrict access to land outside of the specific exemptions within the Land Reform Act. And this is because the effect of putting up barriers, fences, gates or other obstacles is almost always going to be to restrict public access regardless of what the landowner's motives are. And Conversely, this means that authorities such as local authorities who are charged with enforcing access rights will find it easier to argue that obstacles, fences or signs have the effect of restricting public access rights and are therefore in breach of the Land Reform Act. Um, in defending actions raised against them by landowners, the local authorities and other authorities will not usually have to lead evidence in court as to the landowner's intentions as of this decision. What I would say was that this case was decided very recently on the 27th of March 2018 and it's unclear whether it has been appealed to the Supreme Court so we may have to watch this space for more developments. And so um, I'm just going to hand you over now to Neil who's going to talk about the remaining cases. We're now going to focus on two planning cases. And the reason that we've picked two planning cases is because, as uh, Craig mentioned earlier, planning continues to be quite a resource-heavy um, function of a local um, authority. Um, we also know from speaking to local authority clients that getting enough housing within your local authority area continues to be quite challenging. And the fact is that whenever there is a permission granted for a significant development that is challenged by objectors, that generates a lot of resource that is needed to go into defending that action. It can be time consuming both in terms of the, the, the hours that need to be put in on the ground operationally, but also in the, the length it might take before you get a decision. So these two cases, having said all that, ought to provide some reassurance to local um, authorities and planning authorities um, 
about the prospects of successfully defending a challenge. Um, there's also another case, uh, Patton against East Renfrewshire Council, which I'll just touch on briefly in, in part of the discussion, but won't um, cover in any detail. Um, so the first case is Jordan Hill Community Council against Glasgow City Council, um, a decision from February of this year. Um, it was a petition for a judicial review uh, brought by the Community Council against a decision to grant planning permission in principle for a housing development, and that's important, to planning permission in principle rather than permission. Um, the planning committee resolved to, Glanic, to grant planning permission in principle in, in 2013, and that was subject to various planning conditions and the completion of two Section 75 agreements. Planning permission in principle was only actually granted by um, the planning authority in 2017, so you had a four-year gap there. Um, what the um, challengers said was that the authority had failed to take into account material considerations <laughs> and proceeded on factually incorrect um, material. And there were two aspects to that challenge. The first related to green space, and what the challenger said there was that the authority had used plans to identify green space areas that were current at 2013, when the committee made its resolution, but were out of date by 2017. And that was a material change that ought to have resulted in the application being remitted back for consideration again. And the second challenge was similar in, uh, in that it related to traffic impact and public transport provision, again saying that the material was now different in 2017 than that which was presented in 2013, and again that the application should have been remitted back um, for that reason. So in essence, it had been so long, and that's your ABBA reference, which we're very much into diminishing returns now, um, <laughs> between the resolution and the grant of planning perm permission in principle that it should have been returned to the committee for reconsideration. So this is all a case all about what material needs to be produced and that would, would lead to an application going back to being reconsidered again. Um, it is an incredibly lengthy judgment, as judgments often are, from Lady Wolfe. Um, I think it is a, a good judgment to read if you're ever asked to give advice to a planning committee <laughs> or to planning colleagues. And the reason I say that is that at paragraph 36 of the judgment, there is a set of legal principles which are agreed between the parties, and they are all, all the big hitters of planning law when it comes to advising local committees. They talk about the well understood concept of planning judgment and the principle that the court will not interfere with planning judgment unless a planning authority has behaved in a way that is unreasonable or irrational. It, it talks about how you identify a material consideration, and it's, it's described quite eloquently. That is just something that when you're looking at the scales of a decision that's going to be taken, it's a, it's a factor that would tip the scales one way or the other in terms of determining the application. And it also sets out all of the criteria that you would need to consider if something new comes to light and you're thinking about whether this means you need to send that application back to committee to be reconsidered again. So an incredibly helpful full, full, uh, passage in the judgment. Um, absolutely. <laughs> Indeed. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so petitioners here had not demonstrated that the changes in green space um, or the provision of traffic or transport were sufficiently material to demand reconsideration. And even if they had done so, they were still required to demonstrate that there was a real possibility that the authority would have reached a different decision based on this information. And that's part of what's known as the Leckhampton criteria based on a case, the Queen against Leckhampton, um, sorry, Leckworth, right, which, um, which talks about the sorts of things that you would need before sending a case back. They, they, they did, yeah. And, and I think one of the key points here was that the petitioners were trying to look at the plans that had been produced in a very narrow way and say that they were determinants of all these green space areas. But what the um, council said in response is that it was clear that the plans were indicative only and that the actual development would be structured using the Section 75 agreements. Um, and that was the way in which you were going to, to understand the extent to which the green space would be, would be used. Um, a final point just on this slide before I, I move on is that um, the respondents in this case 
try to challenge the standing of the petitioners to bring proceedings. And what Lady Will said about that is that that challenge harked back to an overly restrictive approach to standing, uh, referring to the case of AXA um, and saying basically that, that was now gone, um, effectively as a challenge in a situation like this where you had a, a community council in the area who had objected to the application and it was quite clear that they had standing to bring it. Um, I, I've said that I would mention the patent case briefly. Um, the respondents, well, the interested party in that case, the, the developers, Taylor Wimpey and Kala, also um, brought a standing challenge there. And again, the court dismissed it fairly shortly, saying it was quite clear in that case that a local resident um, who had objected in to the developer, albeit in that case not in name, had standing to bring a challenge. So, so we take from, from that case and from, um, from Jordan Hill that challenges to standing are rarely going to succeed now. You would have to think very carefully, I think, before, before you brought um, a challenge on that basis. Um, so moving on to the case of uh, Byram against City of Edinburgh Council. Um, so again, this is another um, challenge brought by Judicial Review, um, this time to the grant of planning permission for a hotel development within a conservation area. It was the development of the Central Library on George IV Bridge. And the grounds of challenge here were that the authority had failed to regard to the duty to the desirability of preserving the setting of a listed building. So here the Central Library is a listed building and by setting they mean the views of the Central Library and the ability to see the Central Library. Um, they'd also failed to take into account a material consideration which was the change of classification of that listed building. So it was due to change from a B-listed building to an A-listed building and also that the authority had not properly assessed the issue of air quality and had therefore not exercised its planning judgment properly. So this was a challenge on the irrationality or reasonableness of the way that the, the planning authority had dealt with the, the evidence before it. Um, people who have heard me speak about this case before will know that my favourite thing about it is that the cow gate is described as a canyon in the decision. Now that is certainly not the um, scenic description I would give it on a Saturday night. It's certainly the Wild West. Um, okay. So here the petition was refused and I said a moment ago that these cases ought to be reassuring to planning authorities and this one is in particular because what it says is that the courts will not hold, the, they will not uh, interfere with planning reports. What they say is that planning reports have got to be concise and focused and they're not required to respond to every single matter that's raised by objectors. Um, they need to be read by an informed reader. And the risk is that if you take an alternative approach, you'll have um, reports on handling that will become long, elaborate and defensive. And that is what the courts want to avoid because they recognise that planning committees take decisions in different ways from courts and that and elected members take decisions in different ways from courts. So really, this really strengthens, I think, a local authority's hands if you're ever faced with a challenge about the detail of your report of handling. And often that's where challenges will go first. They'll pour over the detail of that, particularly if they're an objector, and say, I objected to this application. Where here in this report is my objection reflected? And what the court says is that not each and every objection um, needs to be considered. And again, um, that was also part of the challenge in Patton and failed in that case, really building on what was said in Byram um, by the court, which is a decision that had come out just before um, the Patton case was heard. Um, on the listed building challenge, what the court said is that it was not a material consideration Everybody knew that the building was going to move from category B to ca category A and it didn't really make any difference to the determination of this application. It might have been a different situation if the building wasn't listed and was about to become listed, but here it was just a category change and in any event it was known to, to all of the parties. And finally the authority was entitled to reach the view that there was no information on air quality that refused the application and that was not irrational or perverse. Now interesting here is that as you do in a lot of cases, you had an expert report um, prepared by the applicant and all you had on the other side of that was a, a letter from environmental services saying that they had some concerns about the air quality considerations. And one of the challenges the petitioners tried to run is that that wasn't good enough. You really needed two competing 
um, expert reports in order to resolve that issue, and the court said you didn't. The, the, the authority was entitled to review the expert evidence that had before it, even if that was expert evidence prepared by an applicant, and to exercise its planning judgment to determine what that meant for, for the application. So again, the court, sticking to its fairly traditional line, which says that if, the, if you can get a decision into planning judgment, then the court is going to be very slow to interfere with that. It will only, I think, be in quite extreme cases that it will do. So as I've said, it, it re-emphasises that high test that must be met in order to reduce a decision. So all good news. Um, I've got to the end of that slide and you're no doubt thinking, where was the uh, Apple link in that, Neil? Well, this one is so tenuous that I can't even bring myself to explain it. Um, it would actually be a pub trivia question. I'll let you work it out for yourself from the facts of this case. The only thing I will say is that the George IV Bridge is important, um, for a fact, if you're going to try and get the answer. Um, okay, finally, and a much more straightforward ABBA reference is money, money, money or more accurately, the most appropriate use of public funds, as I'm sure Bjorn wanted to call the song. Um, this is, I think, actually quite a significant decision, and I think also quite a brave decision by Glasgow City Council. So if there's anybody here fr from the council, well done for bringing this challenge, I think, because it has addressed a concern I've certainly had for a long time, looking at legal aid applications. Um, as local authority solicitors um, and, and uh, officers, you may receive that the provisions in the, the Act which govern um, legal aid did contain <laughs> restraints on the sharing of information. So it, it might not always be appropriate to share all of the information that the applicant provides um, when applying for legal aid. However, the court felt that what should have been done here was at the very least there should have been a disclosure of the intended grounds of appeal. And that way the court could make, an, that way sorry, the council can make an assessment on the strength of the claim and make appropriate representations. Um, the court agreed with the council that the failure to provide that information was unfair um, and, and reduced um, SLAB's decision. And one of the other things that was also argued on behalf of SLAB is that it doesn't want to be in a situation where applicants are required to pr produce lengthy statutory statements, which then results in lengthy representations being made on the other side and in effect, in effect, in effect, that what happens is you've got slabs sitting in a row where it has to adjudicate between these two competing um, representations. Um, the, on that, the court said that that risk was more um, apparent than real. Um, you ought to be able to have a statutory statement which is sufficiently concise and representations that respond to that, um, which would allow the system to work. So I think we finished broadly on time. We've now got time for some questions. Just, uh, yeah, sure. Just going to say um, a quick word before we move on to the question and answer session. And apart from this ABBA thing, this is really what age triumphs over youth. Um, that was a session delivered by a pair of super troopers. Um, I would just like to say that Neil is very guilty of hiding his light under the bushel. Um, Neil is a solicitor advocate with lots of experience in planning GRs and appeals. So if you have a planning SOS, um, Neil should be saying to you, take a chance on me. And if asked, do you do a good job, he should be saying, I do, I do, I do. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> and if it works for you, it'll be a case of the winner takes it all. <laughs> Um, before we open it up to questions, uh, does anybody want to have a guess at what the reference to the Byram, the, the ABBA reference in the Byram case was? Did you say what song it was? No. I saw, I saw it on Douglas's slide, so I'm not going to guess until <coughs> I give everybody else a chance. Black on Waterloo? He was, he was, indeed it was. Well done. <laughs> he was I'm not sure that was well on the <laughs> Uh, so he didn't have a microphone, so you're going to have to explain that for the live stream. Yes, sorry, the, the answer is that <laughs> it's Waterloo because George IV was Prince Regent, actually, I think, uh, at the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah, that, that's what I had in mind, but I thought, no, that's too tenuous, even for what Neil describes. <laughs> but, okay. Um, okay, questions? Questions, observations, experiences? Anybody else got any other cases from the last year or so that you think would be worth sharing with everyone? 
We've got Karen in the front. The Just get you the microphone, Karen. Sorry, on the planning front, having a vested interest, Neil, I know that you've been involved in some, um, or that you've maybe experienced an upturn in the number of cases involving LRBs going forward. It might be helpful to say a few words yeah. about those, just any of the trends you've seen the mayor's yeah. So absolutely. So we've certainly seen an increase in challenges brought by objectors, particularly in small developments, um, where the decision is not large enough to have gone to, to the reporter. So your appeal route is not that way, but it's gone to the LRB and a decision has been taken um, where it's a relatively small development, but you still have to look at all of the policies. So it really harks back to what Craig and Karen were saying earlier. It can be quite complicated to work through those documents. And also touching on what Douglas has said, um, having had to, to, to act as a um, legal advisor to a planning committee recently for a client, it's incredibly difficult to get the elected members to focus on the documents and to explain that they've looked at them and to explain why the decision they're about to take accords with planning policy. And I'm seeing a lot of knowing nods around the audience. But the risk for, for um, elected members is that they then take decisions that are vulnerable to challenge. And we've seen at least two cases which haven't gone to appeal where the advice that we've given has been, I think you're going to have to concede this because of the way in which the decision has been taken. But so that's certainly one of the trends we're seeing is an increase in, in LRB challenges. And you, you've still got that sort of consistent um, stream of sort of developer to developer um, challenges that, that are also in the background too. More questions, comments? No? Okay. Um, thanks very much, Neil and Douglas. Uh, would you guys mind moving the slides on one? So I think we've got your contact details first. <laughs> Sorry, if, any, if anybody does want to take advantage of that. Um, just before we close, uh, well, first of all, thanks very much to Neil and Douglas Thank for you. their session. Um, just before we close, uh, some of you will be aware, uh, some of you may even have attended uh, some of the webinars that we've been running. Um, we have a series going on at the moment. Um, these are the uh, upcoming sessions that we have. Uh, so we've got um, planning, um, but different from what we discussed today. Uh, some more judicial review uh, material, um, a session on procurement and a session on adults with incapacity. Um, so uh, if, if you're here in the room, there is a sign-up sheet just as you're leaving uh, on the reception desk. So uh, it's everybody's name who's here. If you just want to tick any of the ones that you're interested in, we'll get in touch with you proactively about signing you up. Um, if you miss the sign-in sheet or if you're watching online, um, you can go to the seminars page of the Brodie's website and sign up to any that take your fancy. Um, and I'm sure you will also get uh, an invite uh, about those in due course as well. Um, you will get an email asking for your feedback. We're always very happy to have that. Um, in particular, uh, if there are any other issues that you'd like us to cover in webinars or in future conferences like this, I'd um, love to have that on board. Um, particularly if you're watching online, um, we know that there are people watching online. We're not just speaking into the ether. Uh, what we don't know is who you are or where you are. So if you want to give us any feedback, then please do just drop us a line uh, to let us know how you found the experience. Um, the slides, uh, I think we will be sending them out. So uh, apologies if anybody's got writer's cramp from trying to scribble everything down as they've been going, um, but you will get those. Um, so uh, otherwise, I think that's all of our uh, administrative requirements. I'm very pleased to release you back into the wild slightly earlier than build. Um, thanks very much for coming, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>